Coming up, the House Government Reform Committee today continued its investigation into political fundraising. At the witness table for the third consecutive day, former Democratic Party fundraiser John Huang, Indiana Congressman Dan Burton chairs the panel. Before I'm being present, the Committee on Government Reform will come to order. Mr. Wong, we want to once again remind you you're still under oath. We'll now uh, resume questioning with Mr. Souter. I, I thank the Chairman and welcome you again this morning. Thank um, you, Congressman. That yesterday, um, when I, in my last round of questioning, I was talking about the uh, Weir Donata's uh, reef in uh, Soria, and we had discussed some of the uh, evening event that they attended and um, established that uh, your your testimony is is that you didn't uh, you thought that they had a uh, large degree of personal money um, based uh, presumably on your knowledge that uh, uh, Soria's father was Dr. Ning and Dr. Ning was a partner is that correct of Dr. Riotti or Mr. Riotti right in in uh, Lippo and possibly other ventures. That's right. Um, and that um, you were not aware that right before they attended the fundraiser that Dr. Ning had wired each of them $250,000. That is correct. And uh, then they uh, uh, contributed $15,000 each the day after they received the $250,000 each, but you weren't aware of that. I was not well, you're aware of the I was aware of the fifteen thousand dollars not each. the two hundred and fifty. That's right. Now um, on that was on November eighth that uh, evening. On on December fifteenth there was a, a coffee. And uh, did you uh, were you involved in arranging their attendance at the coffee? Yes, I did. Um, did um, uh, what was the purpose of their going to the coffee? They had just been a month ago to a dinner. See, they were they were gonna help me f anyway from the very outset, so that would be an event they could help me for that event. Help you solicit other contributors? No, no, for the contributions. H how are they gonna? They were gonna help you. In other words, they were gonna give you multiple contributions. That's right. Yes. Why wouldn't they have just done that at one time? Because that coffee event did not require for for the all the money. More, more than the, uh, what's required. The, um, and then the records indicate that on December 11th and December 13th, December 15th and December 18th, they each gave $25,000 for a total of $200,000. Congressman, the, from the very outset, I believe uh, the couples were willing to help me for a large sum of money in, in aggregate. So subsequent with various events, so there are different amounts of money coming in, but they were willing to, to, to help me for all the, the much aggregate uh, higher amount for that. The, um But why would you have had a pattern? In other words, since they were given on December 11th, December 13th, December 15th, December 18th, $25,000, uh, four different times, why not just give 100000 Was there a f reason for that? Mm, I could not answer that. Um, and uh, just for the record, that that, that total is $200,000, uh, and they had earlier given, uh, as we established, 30000 so that at this point, the total is um, $115,000 each. Um, now, did you have any discussion with them about why they were willing to put this much money in? This is pretty extraordinary given their uh, 
fairly middle class means at this point. Now again, <clears throat> with the assumption they were quite well off from my point of view. Very outset they were willing to come up with up to $500,000 for, for my effort, for my new jobs. I really need that kind of help as well. Had they ever given dis contributions like this before? Oh, no. Um, what made you think that they would in this election? They offered to me. Uh, and they didn't tell you any reason why they said they would this time, that we've never given any money before, but this year we're going to give hundreds of thousands? Well, the reason, remember, Dr. Hassinin was, was ill in the hospital for quite a few months. And then they also learned um, my new job is going to be in DNC as a fundraiser. And uh, the more or less, is a, there's a sort of a kind of appreciation from their own heart. The, si the type of money they were giving from ordinary purpose, a citizen basis, that's quite a lot. But the way I understood the people was, was some means that really was not really that much in my point of view. Well, um, there, there aren't a lot of, of $200,000 givers, and um, uh, how, how many givers did you have that gave $200,000? Five, roughly, I think. Him, him personally? Yeah, that you raised. Probably four or five, yeah. Um, so there, that's pretty rare, and, and what you're, uh, in essence, telling me, as I understand this, that because her father was ill um, and because they had a visit from Mark Middleton and a, and a thank you card and because you were now over at the Department of Commerce and a, and a friend, they suddenly decided, after having never been involved in politics before, to put hundreds of thousands of dollars each in. That's basically what you're stating. That's right. Uh, may I um, ask... Yeah, may I, the, to finish this uh, round of questioning, my, my concern here is, is that what we find out from the records, which you uh, uh, apparently did not know at the time, was is that, in fact, it wasn't their money. They received $250,000 from Dr. Ning to, to do uh, these contributions because the pattern was they each received $250,000. Then the contribution started the day after that, and, and we're moving then for a, a month or two, which is in, uh, illegal. Uh, uh, but you're saying you weren't aware of that, which I understand. Well, the way I understand our culture, some of the money might be kept by, by the head of the family, but it's being allocated to the various children. Dr. Ning, well, I venture to say right now, since I said it before, has a uh, few wives, so had a different children. I think being head of a family probably has something that's already planned for themselves. It's being allocated for their money. Uh, this is not unusual uh, in our, our culture. I understand what you're trying to say, and I even understood yesterday when we were, or whatever, maybe it was the day before, with Maria Shaw, where you said that the people at the temple uh, have a communal pool of money, they, mm -hmm. they take the money in. But the fact is, is that when you're operating in an American political system, there are laws that have to be followed because while that sounds um, uh, 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 somewhat reasonable on the surface, the fact is this is a way that billionaires and millionaires can alter the face of American politics by having uh, large funds that they suddenly pass through to their kids when they want to run for office or for a candidate that they want to do, they can, they can give it to their children in large sums. It's a way to distort our entire political process. So I, I'm, I'm not arguing that it's not cultural. What I'm arguing is, is that it's illegal because uh, that uh, it didn't come from a trust fund that was operated by them individually, which meant they had control over the money. It meant that Dr. Ning had control over the money because he had the right to check, which therefore becomes his money not their money, regardless of whether he intended it for them at some point or not. This is a, a fairly standard money laundering thing that happens in congressional races, Senate races, presidential races, long before you got involved, and will probably attempt to be, be done in, in the future. But, but these are, are not small items, and it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, um, what, um, uh, you, so, um, did you discuss um, uh, Arif's and, and uh, Soria's uh, contributions with uh, Mr. Riyadi at all? 
you know? About their contribution? Yes. At that time or now? Well, uh, at that time, as it was, the, because of the size of these contributions coming regularly, I think yesterday you said that in general you had, but I wanted to get that clarified. At this point, um, rather than just the 15, now they've each given 115. Have you discussed it after the coffee with Mr. Riotti? Not, not on the event by event basis, no. Um, we're gonna, I would like to show a videotape of the December 15th coffee if we could. This is a December 15th coffee, and we're going to have to get the sound up because, uh, as you should be able to hear, Mr. Mary Donata says, James Riatti sent me. Can you run the tape back and turn the sound up? I want to talk to him. And then, uh, uh, so at one point, Mr. Uh, Uri Donata says, James Riotti sent me, and then if you keep listening to tape, as he speaks to the president, a voice can be heard saying, we should show tapes of the advertisements to uh, Mr. Riotti. Uh, it, this sounds like Vice President Gore. Uh, should show tapes of the advertisements. A lot of the voices were blended, but um, uh, it's clear if you sort the voices out that Mr. Weir Donata says, James Riotti sent me. Why would he say that? I don't know. I, I thought it was just one of the tighter connections that, that he has. You know, he's, he knows James Riotti. Maybe referred, yeah. Why would then... Eat five additional minutes? Yes. Without objection, so order. Thanks. Um, <laughs> Why would the uh, vice president have said we should show tapes of the advertisements to Mr. I, Riotti? I really don't know, Congressman, no. Um, do you think it would be logical, and do you think that the uh, president and or the vice president knew that uh, Mr. Uh, Ning was a partner of Mr. Riotti? Again, I don't know about that. Um, would it seem you don't, did you ever discuss with, um, uh, Mr. Lindsay, Mr. Middleton, or other key friends of the president that uh, 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 Soria was the daughter of uh, Dr. Ning, who was the partner of Lip and Lippo? I don't recall. I personally did. Definitely not Mr. Lindsay. Would it, it, would it be very hard for them to learn of that when they, in other words, a I know, for example, when I get large contributions, which I've never gotten a 200000 because that would be illegal, but $1,000, I would try to find out, oh, what's this person do? What's their background? Would it not seem logical if there are, uh, uh, aren't that many $200,000 contributions that you might try to ask something about them? Yes. And uh, why would the uh, 
Ray Donatas want to establish a connection with Mr. Riotti? In other words, in the president's eyes, were they, in a sense, saying we're part of a group that's behind Mr. Riotti? That I don't know, um, Congressman. Did you counsel them to make any of those kind of ties to Mr. Riotti? Counsel them, them being? Uh, meaning that, uh, in effect, it strengthens the influence of Indonesians because they were Indonesian. No, I did not, no. Um, because uh, you've testified multiple times that part of the goal of this was to try to increase Asian American influence and, and the influence of the multiplicity of interests because you felt that the voices weren't being heard and this is one way to have the voices be heard. It would seem logical then to try to tie it together that you're part of a, a group together. No, if that was, number one, what you stated that that was my purpose. If we're gonna achieve that, we can use different ways through the different channel to, to elevate the Amer Asian American status and uh, by identify the, the community and raise X number of dollars. And that's, that's a, a sort of a help to, the, to the, uh, the party or the campaign. And the political side can, can exercise that kind of uh, the way to do that. In, um, on March 9th in San Francisco, uh, there was a, another fundraiser, um, and um, were you involved in that at the McFarland home in Hillsboro? I was asked to join in in the last uh, probably a few days. Um, exhibit 378 in our briefing notes um, has a guest list, and page one indicates that um, it was supposed to raise 500000 Did you, Did you get involved in the amount that was committed for that? Not for that event, uh, Congressman. In Exhibit 379 and, and 380, there's uh, two more contributions from Arif and Soria, uh, dated 218. Did you solicit those contributions for this event? Yes, I did. Um, how, how did you receive those checks? In fact, those checks was in my control, uh, Congressman. I mean, they had given them to you earlier. Earlier, yes. Were they dated earlier? No, much earlier. As you know very well from various accounts already, uh, Dr. Hashinin probably passed away uh, earlier in that year or the latter part of uh, the previous year. So the, the children will have to go back to, you know, the, all the family had to get together, so they all left. So at the time when they left, although they've already given that sum of money you, you just mentioned, but remaining in commitment. Uh, they also made a commitment. They gave me the checks. I had a control on all those checks. So I have discretion in, in you know, allocate the money into various events. So I was using that. So, so why did you allocate it to this event? Because the whole event, a McFarland event, apparently, based on my understanding, Although designated for, you mentioned the number of $500,000, probably did not achieve the goal uh, based on the, the best estimate. So they need a lot of people to help. So I was one of them to, to, to you know, ask to, to come in with some, some contribution. So to some degree, you were holding um, uh, Harris and Soria's contributions to fill gaps whenever you felt that there was a shortage and it might look bad, you just stick checks from them in and then say, hey, will you go to this event? It is exactly a start of you just put it better words than I could, I could find, yes. In the, um, on May 13th, 1996, there was um, uh, another event. They contributed $100,000 in four different checks of $25,000 each. Um, that, uh, is this the same? Same concept, yes. On June 9th, the Feinstein dinner, um, that, uh, in addition to yourself, I, I may not pronounce this name, uh, XIA, how do I? Xiao. Xiao. Xiao Dai attended yeah. this. He's the head of Asian securities, um, uh, in a number, um, He's also listed as entering the White House on the 6th. Now, um, were you involved in this fundraiser at the home of Senator Feinstein? I was not involved in the organizing fundraiser. It just, uh, the event was there. I just have Mr. Dai and join in to, to participate at the event. And your testimony is, is that the same thing here where there were two contributions of $25,000 each 
and then another one from uh, Reef uh, attached to the Feinstein event. It was part of the filling in. Right. Um, the um, why was Di at this event? Uh, he was, I believe, was a partner with the Lippo, and uh, he happened to be uh, in the United States. And I would refer so that it might be interesting for him to join in on that. Were the, um, the, the, the gentleman's time has expired. Does, uh, does anybody uh, have any questions at this time? Other, uh, if, if, I, uh, this last, this not a, last if not, without objection, we'll yield you five additional minutes. Um, did, uh, was $25,000 the amount of letting somebody into the event? For, I believe that was a, that's a ticket amount. Yeah. And so the third a ticket was for Mr. Dye? You're talking about the June one? Uh, yes, June 9th. I believe so, yeah. Um, and, and myself, uh, I think. It's just two of them. So he, uh, he didn't give any money. He used one of their that is correct. effective pass. Um, the um, Asian Wall Street Journal reported in 1994 that the Bank of China bankrolled his uh, purchase of the Lippo Group share of Asia Securities. Do you know if that's true? I don't know about that. Did you ever discuss him with the Lippo Group, Mr. E Dai? Except I mentioned to you he was a, he might have been the partner well, with, the, with the Lippo or purchased some interest from Lippo. That's about all, that, uh, to the extent I knew about that. Did you uh, discuss his attendance at this event with anybody from Lippo? Did anybody from Lippo call you and say, hey, he's over in the country, we'd like him to come to this event? Uh, what kind of... Yeah, Mr. James Riotti is indicating he might be in town, you know, and uh, that's why I commented on that. So Mr. Riotti called you and said, yes. we would like this uh, gentleman. Uh, so did Mr. Riotti feel that, uh, that to some degree, in your opinion, were you doing this as a favor to Mr. Riotti, or do you believe Mr. Riotti felt that to some degree if the uh, Ray Dinatra's money was there, he could call to have it used for somebody with his organization. I was doing favor to Mr. Riotti. Um, and that, uh, uh, did you consider this unusual at all? No. And I, 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 I know that uh, you're almost a perfect practitioner of the administration. They have a frustration with this in other areas, but clearly you're a perfect practitioner of don't ask, don't tell. But I'm still going to ask you this question. Did you ask why he wanted him to come to this event? I suspect probably it's going to be, be good for Mr. Riotti. Yeah. Um, but you don't know how it was going to be good for Mr. Riotti? No. Because this person was bankrolled by the Bank of China to come into the Lippo Group for their share of Asia Securities. Um, but, um, uh, okay, let me ask you one more. July 22nd, 1996, once again, uh, Soria contributed $25,000 to this uh, event, um, and I assume you it's the same thing. Did you, did you tell them when you were putting the money in for the different events, or uh, call and invite them to come? How did that pattern work? No. I had a full control of these, uh, these checks anyway. As the situation arises, I just uh, use my own discretion to utilize those funds. I don't know what the July 22nd event was about. Uh, Congressman, can you tell me um, what would that be? I don't know either. Let me ask. Mr. Riotti was at the event, um, apparently, and, um, and he sat at the head table on July 22nd, 1996. That's in Los Angeles one? Yes. Was? Yes. In Central City? Yes. Well, I assume it's Central yeah, City. Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, so um, once again, because you had control of these contributions and you viewed, apparently you viewed these contributions as, uh, uh, it's hard for me to understand because they gave the money, in effect, after Dr. Ning passed away, you said they went back to Indonesia but they had given you the checks before they left the country. Right, and with the intention to come back, though. Oh, with the intention to come back. Right. And, but you're under control of these to be used at your discretion in the way that you would feel they'd have the maximum influence for what? To influence the president, uh, to benefit friends, to benefit Mr. Riotti. The, the main purpose is that because this, is, this was the first time I'd become a fundraiser uh, in DNC, 
and also I have a personally I set a mission trying to do something for the Asian Asian American community. But when I do event, there's no assurance that each event is going to be a successful one. For instance, there might be a shortfall situation. It's always nice to have some larger supporters money sitting like a reserve type of thing, just in case there's a shortfall. So you can, you can utilize the funds then to come in to make up the numbers. Uh, that was a key intention on that. But along the lines, certainly, the, it may come in, a certain person may be interested in coming in. I had the discretion to say, okay, you become the number. But money is it's already there. I understand the concept that you're putting forth on the control of the, the money. Um, but what it does appear to be a pattern of is not so much a pattern of just helping the Asian community because the Asian, it appears to be a pattern of helping Mr. Riotti because we started with the tape where uh, that Arif and Sonia are saying Mr. Riotti sent us, uh, then the vice president saying, show him the commercials. Then we have uh, the, the gentleman from uh, Mr. Dive, who uh, the Bank of China bankrolled his share of Asia securities from Lippo Group. Uh, that uh, then we have Mr. Riotti at a head table. So the continuity that we see through this is Mr. Riotti. Uh, is that because you believe Mr. Riotti was the best way to influence uh, the interest that you were advancing? Because you didn't invite just kind of random uh, Asian Americans with the money. It's not, at least the, this is not the thoughts I have. He was not really the best person to influence uh, the president. Uh, I would not question the reality is probably getting the benefit out of that. But from, from very outset, this person was referred by Mr. Riotti. So in my mind, is in that period of time, a situation arises, it just happened that way. Thank you, and it, but, but it does uh, show, the records, looking historically back now, do show that the money, it wasn't only that they were influenced through Mr. Riotti, the fact is, is that the uh, money to them that was then given for your control came from his partner, uh, which you did not know at the time, according to your testimony, but in fact that uh, it does look like uh, money came through and the way it followed through fits that. So, now, Congressman, in terms of money part, even at this stage, I still don't have any reason, you know, to believe that's not their money, at this, that's even at this stage. But we, we, we showed yesterday an exhibit that there was a Without objection, gentlemen, but, get five additional minutes. But I understand what you're saying, but I think in... In your, in your mind, it's their money, right. and, their, and her father was just holding it, but that's not the law. I understand what you're saying. I, I, maybe we're, we're talking from different angle on that basis. At this moment, I did not know at that stage that it was that way. Um, talking about the relationship the, for influencing by the reality, Mr. Riotti has already known Mr. President ever since the Arkansas time. Uh, so, so I don't think that every instance is influencing you know, on that basis. Sir. So, uh, they, were, they were friends already, uh, <laughs> but they were, so he was giving him these, well, the, he did a, uh, in other words, it doesn't particularly comfort me that he was influencing from the time they were back in Arkansas, but that uh, at the same time, uh, he rode in the limousine, prom he wanted the time to give him a, a million dollars we went through with Mr. Hubble, where he, uh, bailed out as a as a friend, predominantly with with some job attachments. Uh, that we had multiple meetings with Mark Middleton, several of which were social, but clearly by the third one where he was separate was more than just a, a social visit because he had multiple visits a day. That that some of it, there is no doubt, some of this that anybody is attracted to kind of the power and prestige of of an administration. You like to go visit, bring your family. Uh, that's fairly standard. But this is beyond that, and and you acknowledge at the very beginning that he had a multiplicity of interests. I mean, right. Mr. Riotti was at, at China Energy at one point. He's, he's that the, when we talked yesterday briefly about the coal interest, the island, where at least one, there's two companies there. We know he has interest in, in one. We don't know the other. Appears to be now, since Escalante Wilderness Area, or Escalante National Monuments off from, from coal mining, appears to be the largest coal reserves in the world uh, of, of this non uh, 
polluting coal or not as much polluting coal. So that's another interest. Um, uh, we, we're still sorting through what other kind of banking interests there are. So while they're friends, uh, you acknowledge at the beginning he has a multiplicity of interest here. It isn't just a friendship. But you, with, you're with, absolutely with, correct, yes. With you, the you, gentleman you, yield, I'm done. Thank the, you very the much. gentleman yield briefly? Yes, I'll yield to the uh, I don't think this ought to be fuzzied up. Uh, yesterday, uh, you were asked a question by Eleanor Holmes uh, Norton, and uh, that question, uh, she uh, uh, asked you uh, whether or not uh, there was uh, influence being acquired, so to speak, from these, uh, from these contributions. And you downplayed the benefits to the Lippo Group from the million dollars in contributions that were made after the, uh, after the limousine ride. Uh, we looked at your 302s, your FBI 302s. I want to read to you what the FBI said that your statement was. This is on page uh, five, and it says, uh, James Riotti was more active than Wong in politics at the time Wong made his first contribution in approximately 1987. Wong advised that in the banking business, it was necessary to establish numerous contacts. Such contacts were important in order to drum up business for the Lippo Bank. The philosophy of the Riotti family was that if people attended functions, they would get to know more people, which would help them personally and in business. Wong explained that people who do business need political contacts. The U.S. was a very powerful country, and other countries pay attention to what happens in the U.S. It is important for foreign businessmen to establish contacts or links in the U.S. Foreign businessmen who maintain political contacts in the U.S. are highly regarded in foreign countries. For instance, a foreign businessman would be highly regarded in his country if he is seen greeting a U.S. senator in a familiar manner. Although Wong doesn't recall a specific conversation with James Riotti concerning the above, Wong was certain, certain that he had a conversation with James Riotti at some point in time about this. Now, the impression that you're giving in the line of questioning is, you know, that there really wasn't any ties to all this. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Wong, they did expect that this was going to result in some positive results for them because they got to know great leaders like the president by giving them a lot of money. Now, isn't that the case? That's not remotely what Congressman Souter asked you. Okay, so make it very plain. It is true. You agree 100% with the 302. Mr. Chairman, I agree 100% what you, you just read on the 302, the concept, the benefit they're going to get. Uh -huh. But I didn't believe what Mr. Souter was referring in the way you, you, know, you were characterized on that. Well, I, I think they we'll are going to get benefit. That's no doubt. It's also multiple interests on that, and they are going to get benefit on that. So, 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 what Mr. Riotti and you were trying to achieve through these large contributions were access, number one, and number two, to become very friendly, so that if a decision needed to be made, you would have a very good connection with whoever it was. Now, the, through all these events, the other very major things which I, you just refer in the 302 is by meeting with a lot of business people. You know, those people can become a big donors and also a big, big businessman that create an opportunity for them to know them and then probably will have a joint ventures being made in, the, in the Asia. Those becomes a business, a business benefit. At least the conceptually that was done on that. The philosophy of the Riotti family was that if people attend functions, they would get to know more people which would help themselves personally and in business. Wong explained that people who do business need political contacts. The U.S. was a very powerful country. And other countries pay attention to what happens in the U.S. It's important for foreign businessmen to establish contacts or links in the U.S. Foreign businessmen who maintain political contacts in the U.S. are highly regarded in foreign countries. So you expected to benefit, and reality is expected to benefit from these contacts. I, I got to talk about it the other way. One of the things I, I need to, what you did not read, probably is very in what my thoughts was in what you just read on the 302. Think about this. Uh, the Riotti family, they are 
Indone uh, Chinese Indonesian. They are overseas Chinese. You know, looking back in the histories, many businessmen in those Southeast Asian countries, because of the lack of political ties, whatever regime changes, whatever they have accomplished, however successful they were in the business side, can turn around to nothing on that. So one of the way to, I assume they, they were trying to do, if they have some ties with the United States in a dominant way, that will portray them much better in the, in the domestically in their, uh, the various country where they resided in. That is, that's the thoughts I really, really did not, did not mention. That would be if, a benefit. If the gentleman would continue to yield, we'll, we'll grant him five additional minutes, but let me go on to the next paragraph then. It says, the transition from Wong's first contribution to the time when he began making numerous contributions to various campaigns began when Wong became, became involved in the community and began working with community leaders. Wong began to receive telephone calls requesting that he raise money for various candidates. At the time, Wong's primary goal was to get the 1990 immigration bill passed to get the 1990 immigration bill passed. However, Wong's contributions were also intended to benefit Lippo Group in the long run. Wong used his own money to pay for the contributions because making such contributions was part of his job at Lippo Group due to his expected involvement in community relations, but you told us that you were reimbursed for those. Right. So that did come from the Lippo Group. There was an understanding that Wong would support Lippo Group by making contributions. This understanding was evidenced by the dollar amount Wong received for his bonuses. It was part of Wong's job performance to make these contributions. Wong submitted written reports to James Riotti, perhaps annually, listing who Wong had contributed to and the dollar amounts of such contributions. Sometimes Wong had discussions with James Riotti regarding the candidates who received contributions. Although Wong and James Riotti did not explicitly discuss Wong being reimbursed for the contributions listed on the reports, Wong knew that he would be taken care of, quote, for doing such a good job, which was reflected in Wong's bonuses. So the fact of the matter is that you were trying to get the immigration bill passed, and you felt like, and I presume the Riottis felt like, large contributions to the right people would help get this done. That's a part of the interest of, you know, the multiple interests in that. That's one of the interests. Certainly I know, but the, but the point is, and I think what Mr. Sauter was trying to make, and I think he's made it very well, is that there was a pattern here. You give money, you get access, you give money to the right people, and things start to move the way you want them to move. And that was what you were concerned about. There's, Mr. Chairman, what you said was true on that, but there's some distinction. Ms. Sada was talking about in 1996 that he related to Arif or Soraya's. I understand. Yeah, right. I but understand. what you was talking about it was 1992 to 1994 when I was with the Lippo at the time. But the conceptually, basically, that's correct. Mr. Sada, I yield back. Mr. Sada yields back to balance his time. Uh, do you want to go next, uh, Mr. Shays? Thank you, Mr. Uh, I'm, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy to yield my time to Mr. Lotteret. Thank you very much, Mr. Shays. And I, I only need about five minutes in this round, I think, uh, to, to clear up Mr. Wong uh, where we were yesterday. And just to, to refresh your memory and sort of give myself a, a reprieve, too, we, we were talking about the coffee. Uh, at the White House that we now call the John Wong Coffee at the White House on June the 18th, 1996. And I think where I uh, left off and maybe where the hearing closed yesterday was uh, there were uh, a few uh, late invitees to the, uh, to the coffee and, and specifically let me read you again what one of them had to say uh, after uh, uh, the uh, Democratic National Committee Chair, Mr. Fowler, indicated that the 1996 election was just as important as the uh, 1860 election wherein Abraham Lincoln became our 16th president, uh, which I think that came as a little surprise to me and probably most Americans that 
and the election, the re-election of uh, William Jefferson Clinton was as significantly uh, in history as, as the election of Abraham Lincoln, but be that as it may. Um, they then indicated that you, as the DNC vice uh, chair for finance, stood up and said, elections cost money, lots and lots of money, and I'm sure that every person in this room will want to support the re-election of President Clinton. Now, <clears throat> I understand that, uh, and again, I read you the names of uh, not only uh, Carl Jackson, Clark Wallace, uh, but also R. Roderick Porter and John Taylor indicate that that observation was made in the White House at the time uh, of this function. And, and, and you, I, I think you understand the what, what's troubling about the statement. Uh, there's two things. If there was nobody at that coffee uh, except for people who um, uh, worked for the DNC or people who were invited, who you acknowledged yesterday, weren't, weren't going to give uh, donations. There was no one who could lawfully contribute to the President of the United States at that coffee. That's the first thing that's troubling. The second thing that's troubling is, is this whole notion of, of soliciting campaign cash uh, at the White House. I mean, the, the White House owned by the people of the United States. But, but uh, I would, you've had overnight to think about it, and I indicated to you that everybody uh, has filed affidavits, testified under oath. In fact, that's what you did at that occasion. And I'd ask you again, as having reflected over it over the last eight hours, is there anything you want to add to your statement no, yesterday? No, I, I do not. No. Okay. Now, uh, we were talking about Pauline Kanchanlak, and, and one, one thing as I was reviewing notes last night is apparently Ms. Kanchanlak, is, is, uh, her checks say P. Kanchanlak, and somewhere she's made the, the allegation that that's really her mother uh, who's uh, initial, did you ever see her mother at, at any of these functions? Is her mother a donor to your knowledge? I might have, might have been introduced on one occasion, a very large fundraising event, being introduced, one of a Thai lady was as a, her mother-in-law or something like that. Okay. Well, I, at this uh, w understanding that you didn't say that, that uh, campaigns cost lots and lots of money and everybody should support the president, regardless, the coffee on the 18th of June did raise lots and lots of money, at least lots and lots of money was credited uh, as a result of that coffee. And uh, Pauline Kanchanilak is credited with uh, giving $135,000 to the DNC uh, at that event. And her sister-in-law, is it Georgie Cronenberg, is that her name? Yes. All right. Uh, gives $50,000 uh, as a result of that coffee. Do, where did you, where and when did you receive their checks? of $135,000 and $50,000 for the coffee? I was, there is a series of checks coming in at different time. I really could not put it in the sequence. I do know in some of the checks I went to the office, her office, to pick it up. And, and do you know the original sources of, of where the funds for these contributions came from? I do not know. Right. Uh, if you could look in your book, uh, the other thing that was going on that I, that I think bothers me just as much as this whole notion of illegal money coming to the Democratic National Committee is at the same time illegal money is going to Democratic Party organizations in the various states uh, as a, and directly following this, uh, uh, well, at about this time, Pauline Kanchanilak and her, and her sister-in-law, Georgie Cronenberg, are also writing some checks to state Democratic organizations, are they not? That's correct. Okay, if, if I could turn your attention first to exhibits 446 through 450, uh, I, I think you will find that these are checks uh, made out by Pauline Kanchanilak to, the first one is to the Florida Democratic Party for $35,000, the Illinois Democratic Party for $25,000, one that I find particularly obnoxious, the Ohio Democratic Party for $33,000, uh, and the Pennsylvania Democratic Party uh, for $25,000. Now, do you know, uh, was Pauline Kanchanilak just a lover of the states? I mean, was, was, or how did these, how is it that, that a major uh, national donor who is at a coffee at the White House and is contributing gobs of money illegally to the President of the United States re-election, uh, how does such a person become interested in making a donation of $33,000, for instance, to my home state, uh, to the state of Ohio Democratic Party, to be used for? I mean, let's be clear about this. This, is, this money is, is to be used for uh, Democratic Party building activities within the state of Ohio, 
uh, not tied directly to the election, uh, re-election of the President of the United States, but to be used in, in races for state representative, governor, secretary of state, Ohio attorney general. I mean, this woman, uh, through these illegal contributions, is not only tainting the re-election process of the President of the United States, but she wants to have a hand in the election of everything from president to dog catcher. Now, how did, how did these checks get written? Okay, first of all, uh, Ms. Canchanela has expressed to me she was a bit concerned because she was written in a magazine called Mother Jones. I think that's right. It's called Mother Jones. I, There's I'm, a magazine. Yeah, I'm that. familiar with Mother Jones. Right. Uh, so her name was mentioned over there. She did not, you know, if she prefers to keep a little bit low profile, and uh, if she suddenly have all the money, a very large sum of money appearing on the uh, on the report, she felt less comfortable with any way, you know, can spread that things out. And I ventured to check with the uh, DNC, and uh, so have so this money is being reallocated to various state party. Okay, but well, let me get this straight. So Mother Jones writes an article, and, and Pauline Kanchanlek shows up as what one of the top ten givers to the Democratic Party in the country, or some some list. Uh, Whatever the the what, ranking will be, yeah. Her name was on the list. That, that yeah. she she's a big player, uh, and and so she says, how can I how can I not be so obvious to Mother Jones and other people that are interested in she this? She was concerned about that, yes. Right. Could I ask unanimous consent for just two more minutes, Mr. Chairman? Would that be a... Oh. Uh, does the gentleman uh, need additional time? It, just a couple minutes. If Without I objection, gentlemen yield five additional. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So, so she comes to you with this problem. She says, listen, I, I don't like being in Mother... I was in Mother Jones once, and I didn't like it very much either, to tell you the truth. But uh, so she comes to to you and says, how can I get off this Mother Jones list? Uh, and you, you say, She well, expressed concern you know, during the conversation with me. Okay. And so you then go to the, the DNC and say, Pauline Kanchanlek, that we know is high maintenance already, based upon some things you said yesterday, wants to get off Mother Jones' contributor list. Uh, and how does she do that? And someone says to you, well, she can write, rather than writing one big check for a million dollars, she can write a bunch of littler checks to uh, state party organizations. Is that how that works? I may even suggest the, the format is any other outlet we might be able to accommodate, for instance, the state party on that. How, how did the states get picked? I mean, uh, for instance, did you tell her to write a, a $33,000 check to, to my home state of Ohio? <laughs> no, I did not. Oh, did that, you... that state's name is, came out from DNC. Uh, how did she know how to make the check out? Uh, through me. And then we DNC sort of identify, well, okay, okay, you can have a check issued to Florida State Democratic Party for what an amount, for the other state Democratic Party for what amount. Okay, so, so the, the Democratic National Committee not only uh, told you who she should write the check to, but how much, because they're different amounts. I mean, right. I, I, I don't know whether, you know, she, maybe she doesn't like Illinois as much. They only got 25 grand. Ohio got 35 or 33 and Florida gets 35. But all those numbers were supplied by the DNC as suggestions for Pauline Kanchanlek, who we now know is, is a, a Thai citizen, not eligible to participate in any election in this country, uh, that we should, she should write these checks to those organizations, right? I believe so, yes. And, and likewise, her sister-in-law, uh, Georgie Cronenberg, uh, the next set of exhibits that I think run from 452 to 456 uh, are checks that, that uh, Georgie Cronenberg writes to um, to state organizations, and I, I think they're pretty much the same. And again, what I find partic particularly obnoxious uh, is that uh, among these is uh, another illegal contribution of $20,000 to the Ohio Democratic Party. Uh, and did that work the same way? A similar way, yes. That, that you went to the DNC. Was Georgie Cronenberg somehow on a list in Mother Jones, too? Or? I was not sure about her name, though, sir. And, and this, this process isn't unusual, is it? I mean, this... This isn't, the, these aren't the only two people uh, that this is done for. In other words, you, you, you would go uh, and receive a list of state democratic organizations and dollar amounts for other large donors, uh, at, and the DNC would give you that. Uh, well. It happened to me a few times. Uh, as I report to you, Mr. Chairman, uh, on Mr. Riotti yesterday, you brought up, remember, Mr. Riotti also in the 1992 time wrote some checks to the state party. So you have some precedent. So personally, I have some experience on that. Okay. I, based upon what we now know uh, today, and on uh, December whatever it is, 1999, about Pauline Kanchanlak's uh, immigration status at the time that she was writing this, these checks, 
not only the, the $135,000 that she gave it as a result of the coffee, the White House, the John Wong coffee on June the 18th, but also these checks that she wrote to state organizations. All of these contributions are illegal. Uh, you do know that. Today, they're illegal. Uh, assuming the reports are accurate, though, I did not really. Assuming the reports are that she isn't a citizen, that's was not right. a citizen. That's right. That's right. You don't, and you don't, I mean, is there some question in your mind about that? I, I don't know, because from very outset, I always thought she has a, at least green card status. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Oh, Mr. Would, Mr. would the gentleman yield? Well, could I oh, just so make you... a request to the chair? I, I know that, uh, Mr. Chairman, that during the course of this uh, uh, discussion, there was some talk about the Democratic National Committee returning a, a million six or a million eight and out of the $3.4 million. But, but th this uh, is a whole other layer to me uh, of illegal activity that occurred as a result of of, of this uh, fundraising operation. And I would really ap appreciate uh, if the council or someone on the committee could report back to the committee how much of the money that was raised illegally and sent directly to the state parties to beat Republican state representative candidates, governor candidates, uh, uh, county commissioner candidates, members of Congress, uh, whether or not the Ohio Democratic Party, for instance, returned these illegal contributions, whether or not the Pennsylvania Democratic Party returned these illegal contributions. And I, I would hope that we could get to the bottom of that and, and, and have a report. And I, I'm sorry I'm a little worked up, but I had some friends losing that election. And now you find out that they lost because people were cheating. And I think that that's unfortunate, and I'd be glad to yield to the chair. I appreciate the gentleman yielding, and I will instruct the uh, committee staff to uh, look into that to find out if any of those contributions were uh, were uh, returned. Uh, w w could could I ask that the gentleman be given an, an additional five minutes? No Without objection, uh, we'll give the gentleman an additional five minutes, and I appreciate your yielding to me. The reason I wanted you to yield to me is uh, Mr. Wong said that uh, he did not know that Pauline Kinchanilak was not a U.S. citizen at the time, and therefore it was illegal for her to give uh, contributions to state parties. However, and I think you've already uh, alluded to this, James Riotti uh, in 1992 had gone back to Indonesia. He did have a home here and he did have a green card, but he was living in Indonesia. And so it was not legal for him, according to the law, as far as we know, for him to give contributions to state parties or to candidates for federal election. And in August of 1992, he gave 5,000 to the California Democrat Party. Uh, August 13th, he gave uh, to the DNC 15,000. Uh, September the 30th of 92, he gave 75,000 to the Michigan Democrat Party. October the 5th, he gave 75,000 to the Ohio Democrat Party. Uh, he gave uh, 5,000 to the Arkansas Democrat Party on o October the 8th. He gave uh, 75,000 again on October the 8th to maybe it was the 27th, to the Arkansas Democrat Party. He gave on October the 12th uh, 75000 to the uh, Louisiana Democrat Party. His wife, Eileen Riotti, on August the 13th, gave 5000 to the California Democrat Party. And on August the 17th, uh, or 13th, to the DNC, $15,000. On August the, or October the 8th, she gave 5000 to the Arkansas Democrat Party. Uh, on October the 12th, she gave $50,000 to the Georgia Democrat Party. And on October the 15th, she gave $50,000 to the North Carolina Democrat Party. Now, I assume, Mr. Wong, he didn't know which parties, state parties, those money should uh, go to. Uh, wh whose idea was it to make contributions uh, by Mr. Riotti to these state parties? To the best of my knowledge at a time of arranged to uh, through the DNC at that time. Were, did, were you involved in any way in that? I mean, were you helping him with that? Yeah, I was to facilitate to giving the names of the state party. So you were talking to the state, uh, to the National Democrat Party, saying where do they want the money to go? That is correct. Were you talking to the White House as well about that? No. Were you talking to the candidate for president, Mr. Clinton, about that? No. You, you're sure about that? I'm sure about it. Okay. Did you receive instructions uh, directly from someone at the DNC or elsewhere on where you should direct the contributions? I was working with uh, the lady called Mary Leslie at that time. Mary Leslie. So was she the one that was directing where these contributions were going? 
Yeah, I don't know where she get that information from, but, but she was telling you where right, you ought to send right, the money. She could, yeah, yeah. Did did she know that Mr. Riotti was living in Indonesia? She might. I don't know. Well, if she sure. knew that Mr. Riotti was living in Indonesia, then she must have known it was illegal. Uh, did you tell her Mr. Riotti was living in Indonesia? I suspect she might might be knowing Mr. Riotti was traveling back and forth. Uh, basically. The way I know that Mr. Riotti and Mrs. Riotti had the green card at that time. Did you, but he was living in Indonesia. I mean, it's pretty clear. We've checked the records. He was, his permanent residence was Indonesia. He had a house in California and he did travel back and forth and he did have a green card, but the law is that he was living in Indonesia at the time. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Chairman that may be your, your, your conclusion or that you may be right on that. But I was operating, operating under the, the situation is they both had a green card they were able to give. Did you give instructions directly to James Riotti after you talked to this lady, Mrs., uh, what's her name again? Uh, Mary Leslie. Mary Leslie, as to which states to direct the contributions to or did anyone else directly uh, uh, deal with him to tell him where to send the money? I, I, I did. Uh, tell Mr. Riotti and uh, uh, about various entity of the checks to be written. Yes. Do, do you know where he was, uh, was when he wrote the checks? When, when he wrote the checks, where was he? Uh, it's very hard for me to pin down where he, sometimes he might be over the other side, sometimes he might be here. So sometimes he was in Indonesia when he wrote the checks? It's very possible, yes. And then sometimes it was when he was here? That's correct. Did you or James Riani uh, directly discuss uh, these contributions, or was someone else uh, from uh, the White House or the DNC involved? No, no. It was just uh, between you and, uh, and the DNC? That's correct. And Mr. Riotti? That's correct. But to your knowledge, nobody from the DNC uh, contacted Mr. Riotti directly. It was you? That was, uh, that was correct, sir. OK. Do you have any questions? Yes. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Uh, Chairman, my colleagues, Mr. Wong, uh, just on Mr. Riotti, if he had a green card, that means he's, as I understand, legally able to give a contribution even if he travels and spends most of his time in another country. Is that, was that your understanding? That was my understanding, yes. And the Chairman seems to think otherwise. I don't know. You said he may be right. I don't think he's correct, but since we all have a question of opinion on this matter, it's hard for me to see how Mary Leslie, who, what was her position? I think she was a finance director, at least for California at that time. How she or you or some others might not know whether the contribution from Mr. Riotti was legal or not. You presume it's legal unless you have some indication otherwise. Uh, I, I was pleased that uh, my colleague, Mr. La Tourette, raised the issue of state uh, party uh, contributions to state parties, and I think we ought to look at that. But I do want to point out, again, that the issue isn't just a, a, on the Democratic side. There was a contribution from a Thomas Kramer on, on July 18, 1997. He was a German national, and he was fined $323,000 by the Federal Election Commission for making illegal foreign campaign contributions. This was the largest fine ever imposed by the FEC on an individual. Mr. Kramer contributed more than $400,000 to federal, state, and local campaigns during the 94 election cycle, including $205,000 to the Florida Republican Party. The Florida Republicans were fined $82,000 by the FEC for accepting Mr. Kramer's contribution, but still refused to return $95,000 of the contribution. Uh, we have another instance of, uh, of a, a, a Mr. Kojima uh, and, uh, who gave, was called America's Worst Deadbeat Dad by the L.A. District Attorney's Office. He contributed $598,770 to the Republican Party during the 92 election cycle, including $500,000 to the President's Dinner, which brought, bought him a seat at President Bush's table. And, um, there are a lot of instances. Was he fined? Um, the uh, money for one 
$100,000 contribution was written on an account that would have had insufficient funds, but for a wire transfer from a foreign corporation that was received before the check cleared, Mr. Kojima bought, brought five Japanese businessmen to the dinner. It's been reported that these businessmen paid Mr. Kojima as much as $175,000 each to attend the event. In return for Mr. Kojima's contributions, the RNC arranged for 10 meetings between Mr. Kojima and the U.S. Embassy personnel in Asia and wrote at least 15 letters on Mr. Kojima's behalf. At the time of the contribution, Mr. Kojima was almost a million dollars in debt for failure to pay child support for or his, uh, or his business creditors. Uh, that second example was not particularly a uh, example of a state party contribution, but both of these are two examples of Republican Party yeah. fundraising abuses uh, and, and, and involved foreign contributions. It, it, the, it's the gentleman, you know, was he fine though? That's what I wanted to find well, out. Well, I, I, didn't, I don't think so. I don't know, but I don't think so. If I might continue um, what I have to say, this committee hasn't shown any interest in looking at these Republican, Republican foreign contributions into their party. They haven't shown any interest in looking at why the Florida Republican Party didn't give back that $95,000. Mr. LaTourette La suggested appropriately that we look at this matter, but if we're going to look at it, we ought to look at it in a clear, nonpartisan, fair manner. But this investigation has not been conducted on that basis. What we have today and yesterday and the day before, now that we have Mr. Wong here, uh, is, uh, is an interrogation that's really quite unprecedented to go over and over and over issues on what can't help but be described as a fishing expedition. I, I described a couple of days ago when we started this hearing about the six phases of the investigation, because we've settled into a pattern in this committee of six phases. Phase one, there's a false accusation, and then there are headlines. And then the ha accusations are not supported by any facts. Then there's a claim that there's a, 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 a cover-up. Uh, there's stonewalling. That's why we're not getting the facts. And after that, we get information from those who are presumably stonewalling, they give the information, and there's a clear indication that the facts weren't there to support the original allegation. And then we have the next phase, which is a new accusation that's also false. I'd like to ask for five additional minutes. Without objection, so order. I, usually that plays out over a period of months. Well, I think we can see that having played out in the course of just three days. Now, uh, Mr. Wong, was accused of being the, the, the linchpin of this whole conspiracy to sell U.S. confidential information to the People's Republic of China. He was accused of laundering money from China and uh, that the president knew about it and was part of the conspiracy. The vice president knew it and was part of the conspiracy. And Mr. Wong was asked these questions directly over the course of these last couple of days and he's clearly said, no, the president didn't know anything about it, the vice president didn't know anything about it, he was not an agent of the Chinese government, he did not um, engage in any espionage, he did not give any uh, confidential uh, classified information to either the Lippo Group or the Chinese government. Now, that meant those accusations turned out to be inaccurate. So what do we have? A new accusation. Yesterday, Chairman Burton came in and not, since the facts didn't support his original serious inflammatory allegations, he came back with a new one. And the new one was that Janet Reno refused to ask the president questions about foreign contributions. And he, uh, and he said this is a, an outrage that this didn't happen. And the press picked it up. Uh, Washington Post, Representative Burton criticizes Reno fundraising probe not thorough on roles of Clinton and Gore. I don't criticize the, the Washington Post for reporting the story. When a congressman, chairman of a committee makes an accusation, it's picked up. And the story did report at the end how uh, Le, uh, Mr. LaBella, who headed up the 
task force looking at foreign contributions for the Justice Department uh, said that Janet Reno acted appropriately. Uh, that, in fact, La LaBella emphasized that while he did not agree with Reno's conclusion about an independent counsel, uh, he uh, said the Attorney General does not deserve blame for the decision by prosecutors not to ask questions about foreign contributions prematurely. He said uh, that he w they were not looking at foreign contributions, they were looking at two very specific issues. And, and they asked questions about those issues. They had no evidence that the president knew anything about foreign contributions. And they didn't have it then, and they don't have it now. And so LaBella said, I'm not here to defend her. I'm just, going to, I'm just not going to let her get beaten up unfairly. And I can commend Mr. LaBella for that statement. But let's look at the rest of the press. Now, the, Mr. Wong's been here. He's been accused for three years of all sorts of terrible things. He's, this is the first chance he's had to publicly explain his side. The press didn't report what he had Would to say. Would the gentleman yield? No, not yet. He did, the press didn't report that he, what he had to say that exonerated him from all those headlines of other congressmen attacking him. They report the next charge. Now, I'm pleased to report that one newspaper in this country did give a report, uh, and that was the LA Times, and it makes me especially proud because it was the LA Times. The LA Times headline, FBI notes dispel evidence of security breach by Wong. They picked up what came out at yesterday's hearing, which was that Congressman Solomon made these false accusations about Mr. Wong turning over classified documents because Solomon said he had intercepts and confidential intercepts to prove it, and it turned out that under the FBI uh, in interview with Solomon that it was all based on gossip. Well, at least one newspaper picked up a clarification uh, of, of the, how an uh, accusation was made so long ago and has now been so clearly refuted. But we don't see the accusations that have been refuted. We only see the new ones made, which is a good strategy. And again, it's the phases of this investigation. You make an accusation. You can't prove it. You come back and say somebody's not giving you the information. They give you the information, and then the information doesn't substantiate your allegation. So you come right back with another one. And the chairman's statement, which was picked up in another newspaper, this one you'd expect to have it as the uh, screaming headline. This is the Washington Times. FBI never probed Clinton Gore on key scandal figures. Burton wonders if investigators forgot. Full of sarcasm. Now, the charge is that Janet Reno didn't allow her Justice Department people to question the president about foreign contributions. But it was the FBI who was doing the investigation, and that wasn't the purpose of their investigation at that time. Their questions had to do with whether the president was making calls out of the office. It had to do with whether the president knew about the hard money versus the soft money. Those were the matters for which there had been some evidence of potential wrongdoing that the president might have been involved in. Uh, unlike what we've had with Mr. Wong, Mr. LaBella and the FBI didn't feel that it was appropriate to go into a uh, long dissertation on uh, uh, questioning a president of the United States on everything they might think that he might have done wrong, when there's been no evidence that he ever did anything wrong. And let me just say this about Mr. LaBella. Dan Burton said he has run the task force investigation of foreign money in our elections for the last 10 months. Janet Reno handpicked Mr. LaBella for this job because of his sparkling credentials and his reputation as an outstanding prosecutor. I can't think of anyone in America who is in a better position to know the facts. That's what the chairman said about Mr. LaBella. And Mr. LaBella was quoted, of course, at the tail end of the article, saying that I'm not here to defend Mrs. Reno, but I'm just not going to let her get beaten up unfairly. Uh, I'll take my time now, and I hope the gentleman will be equally generous as far as uh, me getting additional time. Well, I've certainly been generous to you and I to know the you have, and committee. I hope you continue to be that. And way. I hope you will also, Mr. Chairman. I will. First of all, 
Let's start with the last thing first. Uh, I think what you read in the paper was all right, but you left a little bit out. Mr. Labella also said, we always figured we'd have other chances to question the president about his relationship with key fundraisers after developing cases against them. They were never given that opportunity. The president and the vice president were never asked about their connection to Mr. Wong, Mr. Tree, Mr. Riotti. And Mr. Labella felt like, as the head of the task force, that he would get another opportunity to do that, and he never did. That particular meeting you're talking about was limited. But the reason it was limited was because they thought they were going to go back and ask him again about these things, and the Justice Department and Janet Reno never allowed that to happen. That's the first thing. The second thing, you started talking, uh, incidentally, the people who did the questioning at that meeting were not FBI agents. They were all Justice Department people, Robert Meyer, James Cooper, uh, Lee Radick, and Charles Labella. And the FBI guys that were there, all they did was take notes. So the FBI didn't do any questioning. It was the Justice Department, and they were limited. They did not question him about his connection or possible connection with these people who were raising money illegally. Now let's talk about these people like uh, Mr. Kramer and uh, Mr. Kojina. Uh, the FEC found that the Republican Party of Florida got this contribution from Mr. Kramer that you said was illegal. The Federal Election Committee Commission said it was legal. The money that came from Mr. Kramer was legal. Now, I thought that was wrong. And I introduced a bill that was co-sponsored by many of my colleagues, including Mr. Shays and Mr. Souter and Mr. La Tourette, which would say that any foreign contributions coming into this country would be illegal and I asked you to be a co-sponsor, and you said no. Now, Mr. Kramer, because this loophole, the FEC said it was legal. But you didn't want to sponsor or co-sponsor a bill I did that would kill it and make sure that it never happened again. Now, I'd like to once again extend my hand to you and say, I hope you'll sponsor that bill with me. Now, let's go back, let's go back to some of these fines, some of these people who gave contributions. The Republicans that you mentioned with the exception of Mr. Kramer, one was fined, uh, what, $325,000? One was fined $5 million, one was fined $8 million, one was fined $6 million, one was fined, uh, I can't remember all of them. But the, but the Democrats who have given money illegally have not been fined once that I know of by this Justice Department. Or at least if they have been fined, nobody's been fined as much. You show me some that have been fined $8 million, $5 million, $6 million, and got time in jail. Now, there's a couple of other things I think that are important. Let's see what else you have there. I, I, I guess the thing that, 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 that I want to make clear is that if a Republican breaks the law in giving campaign contributions, they should be penalized to the full extent of the law. If a Democrat breaks the law or a foreign entity breaks the law, they should be penalized to the full extent of the law. But the Justice Department should apply the law fairly, justly, and equally. And the Republicans who have broken the law in the Dole campaign have been penalized, as far as I know, some extremely severely. Whereas people like the Riottis and Mr. Wong and Mr. Tree have gotten a slap on the wrist. Mr. Wong, who was responsible for over $3 million in illegal campaign contributions, $1.3 or $4 million that's been returned, got a $10,000 fine and some community service time. Mr. Tree was not even going to get a financial fine at all, and the judge thought that was wrong, so he imposed a $5,000 fine himself, and he got community service time. T 
10,000, 5,000 for two of the major conduits of illegal contributions, while people in the Republican side got an $8 million fine from this Justice Department, a $6 million fine, a $5 million fine, and on and on. And so what I'm saying is there ought to be fair application of the law, and that has not been done. And if you're going to quote Mr. LaBella, for whom I do have a great deal of respect, I hope you'll always tell the full story. And the full story is, and I'll reiterate this one more time, he said, we always figured we'd have other chances to question the president about his relationship with key fundraisers after developing cases against them. The cases were developed against Mr. Wong, Mr. Tree, and a number of others, and they never, Janet Reno never, sent anybody back over to question the president or the vice president. And I'll uh, yield back my time. Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think I ask unanimous consent to be recognized for five minutes. Uh, Could I just have you yield to me, Mr. Chairman? I'll yield to Mr. Shays first. We'll come back to you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I, just a minute, Mr. Chairman. I, I, no, I have let no, the members no. on your side go 15, 20 minutes. Wait, if you, if, if, if I, you I want me to yield to Mr. Shays. has the time. Mr. Shays has the time. I will Thank yield you. to you again. Well, the Mr. Would. Cummings is here, and he's seeking recognition, and he hasn't had his opportunity Fine, but he still has at all time. for his time. I just I, want I to put on the record two points. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to make a point of order. Point of order, points. Mr. Chairman. This is a gentleman, point of order. Gen gentleman will state his point of order. The rules of this committee provide that members shall have five-minute rounds each. Right. And no member shall be recognized for a second round until all members have been recognized for the first round. I'm not asking to be recognized. I'm asking for the gentleman's time. I'm not asking for. You're my asking time. for my time? No, no. Mr. Burton. Mr. Well, Burton's uh, time has expired. The gentleman, I'll, st I'll, I'll respond to his point of order. We are already in the second round. Mr. Cummings just arrived. I'm going to yield to Mr. Shays. Well, Mr. Point. Cummings is seeking recognition and has not been recognized mm -hmm. on the first or the second round. I, I will recognize Mr. Cummings as soon as I recognize Mr. Shays. Mr. Mr. Shays. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. The rules I provide. Ruled on, I have ruled on your point of order, Mr. Shays. Mr. Chairman, point of order. General, just, general status point of order. I was here before the first round ended, and I'm just trying to figure, does that mean that I am denied a right to ask questions in the first round? You will have... Uh, uh, Ten uh, minutes. Mr. Uh, you will be recognized as soon as Mr. Shays completes his question. But you didn't answer my question, Mr. Chairman. I just asked you one simple question. Do I get to ask my questions in the first round, because I'm going to ask them in the second round, too, or am I limited to the second round, or are you going to give me 10 minutes in the second round? We will be liberal with our time, but our staff has just surprised and made me aware. I'm, I'm just, just curious of one thing. Mr. Just, Chairman, I, I on the point of know, order, I wish to be recognized. I just want to know who has Mr. Chairman, time. I wish to be recognized on the point of order. <laughs> I have ruled on the, the point no, of order. The, the, the point of order is still pending, and I want to bring I, an argument to the chair before. I have ruled on the point of order. Well, the chairman has not read the rules, and the rules say that each member point. gets five minutes before others get it, and we alternate one side and then the other. Mr. Uh, Cummings has not been recognized yield? at all. Would the He's seeking yield? recognition. Would the gentleman just yield the for a You want to yield on his point of order? I'm just asking first, uh, I'm not asking for five, my five minute time, and I'm very happy to have Mr. Cummings have his time. I just want to know do you still have the time? left or had your time run out. If your time I, ran out, I'm not asking for you to yield. I did have some time left on the clock. Okay. How much all, time did I have I left? No, you all, think all, you, no, you all, didn't. Mr. Waxman. Uh, according to the staff, I had one minute left on the clock. Mr. Mr. Waxman, if, if you don't agree, I'm happy to just drop it, because frankly, you want to make a circus out of this. I don't intend to. I just intend to ask some questions. I thought my, my, my chairman had the time. If he didn't uh, have the time, I, I don't, don't think ask he did, you. and he's now being told his staff has a, a minute left. But I looked at that clock, uh, and the red light Mr. came up. Mr. Waxman, and, and, and once I don't again, think he does Mr. Waxman, the time. I totally withdraw any complaint. I'm happy to wait. I'm well, going well, to be here all day. No, all right. Mr. Chairman. I understand, but I'm the chairman of the committee, and I will say this. There was one minute left on the clock. We will take the one minute, and I yield to Mr. Shays. Thank you, and I'm happy to yield back. Mr. Cummins. Thank you very much. Uh, we certainly aren't trying to make a circus here, uh, Mr. Chairman. We're just trying to go by the rules, as the ranking member has uh, stated. Will the gentleman yield to me? I, I certainly will but yield to Mr. Waxman. Mr. LaBella said that they would go in and ask the president questions if they developed a case that indicated that he in any way knew that foreign contributions were involved. The, the only way we could ever establish a case that Mr. Uh, Clinton knew was if someone said he knew. Mr. Wong indicated, and he was the one involved in, in raising the, this money, 
that the President of the United States never knew about these foreign contributions. But I do want to point out about somebody who did uh, participate as an office holder or has been accused of knowing as an office holder by the person involved in giving a condu conduit contribution. There's a fellow named Claren in Texas. He admits to having given a, a conduit contribution to a Republican House candidate. And then he not only admits having done it, he said he did it at the, at the request of Congressman Tom DeLay, the Republican whip. Now, when you have the man who admitted to giving the conduit contribution say that the office holder suggested he give it, you would think that ought to be investigated. The chairman's not mind everybody being fair. This committee refused to even investigate that matter. Every Democrat wrote a letter to the chairman requesting an investigation of these very serious charges of campaign violations. To show how serious it, are, it is, it's as serious as Mr. Wong's uh, violation of the law because what Mr. Wong did was a conduit contribution and what Mr. DeLay is accused of doing is a conduit contribution uh, as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I hope that you will now tell us you're going to investigate that clear indication where someone was involved. And the distinction again is there's evidence that Mr. DeLay was involved and knew there, not only knew but orchestrated a conduit contribution. There has not been any evidence not been a lot of headlines and charges, but there's never been any evidence to indicate that the President of the United States knew of any foreign contributions. And the, and the one who would have been able to give evidence to that effect, and who you described as the linchpin of this whole campaign scandal, is Mr. Wong. And he has told us explicitly that the President didn't know about it. So I would hope uh, that the Chairman will now tell us that he's going to investigate the charges by Mr. Claren, who's an active Republican who gave a conduit contribution, he says, at the request of Mr. DeLay. The gentleman will yield. Uh, thank you. Will the gentleman yield? Yes, I'll yield. You know, you keep talking about Mr. Claren and have been for some time. His allegations were investigated fully by your Justice Department and they found that Mr. Claren's investigations were baseless. His allegations were baseless. Now Mr. Claren was convicted of other crimes. He was convicted. He was convicted of other crimes. And it sounds like you're accusing uh, Mrs. Reno's Justice Department of doing something wrong. Uh, Mr. Uh, the, the whip of the house, Mr. DeLay, has been exonerated, in effect, by the Justice Department. Now, for you who have complained about us wasting a ton of time at this committee, to want to go back and investigate something that has been fully investigated by the Justice Department seems ludicrous. I mean, Mr. Claren was convicted himself. The Justice Department found no credence in what he said, and they dropped that investigation. Gentlemen, yield. That's, yes. a, that's an absolutely false statement that the chairman has made. There has not been a clearance of Mr. DeLay. Uh, by the Justice Department. It is just absolutely incorrect. And it isn't it pretty ironic that Mr. Burton would say, we're not going to investigate a matter because the Justice Department, he thinks, has already disposed of it. What are we doing here now? We're, we're questioning Mr. Wong for three days uh, and spending $7 million in the last Congress on this investigation <laughs> when the Justice Department has already investigated it and uh, penalized Mr. Wong. Uh, it, it seems to me that you can't make these false statements, false accusations, and figure it never will catch up with you. Except it looks like Mr. Burton's succeeding somewhat, although I don't think it has much credibility, because he's always got another charge, and always another accusation, and then nothing substantiates those allegations, and now just a flat-out false statement about the, uh, about the delay clearing business. Thank you for your attention. Reclaiming my time. Um, I think that, you know, when we sit in this room, Mr. Wong, um, there are only a few people here as compared to some of our hearings. But the things that are stated here are certainly uh, on the record and you are sworn. And the things that you say uh, can have a direct bearing on a lot of people's lives, including your own. And so I've been following the hearings. I had an opportunity to read the FBI 302s and just have a few questions because I think Taking in, in light of what I just said, I just want to make sure we, we are all clear because what happens is that you start, you get a question here, a question there, and it gets muddled. And, but sometimes we need to stop and pause to be clear. 
And uh, so I just ask you a few questions. Your FBI interviews indicate that you and Mr. Riotti discussed soliciting contributions from the LIPO executives who had substantial means and could afford to make political contributions. Uh, is that correct? That is correct. Now, by discussing who could give contributions, it seems that you and Mr. Riotti we're trying to make sure that you comply with the law in this regard. Is that correct? That was an effort, yes. You did not, did, you didn't believe that the plan to raise political contributions from LIPO executives who were citizens or green card holders and who had means was illegal? Did you believe that was illegal? No, sir. Similarly, similarly you did not believe that soliciting these people to make contributions was illegal. Is that right? No, sir. Now, when you had these discussions with Mr. Riotti, you did not discuss with him the reimbursement of these LIPO executives for their contributions, did you? D did you understand the questions? I understand. We did not explicitly mention that, no. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. We did not explicit mention about reimbursement, no. Okay. Um, so, so you, you, you did have a discussion, but you did not explicitly talk about reimbursement. Is that what you're saying? I basically I sensed that need all the people probably will be taken care of. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent the gentleman from Maryland be given a five additional minutes. Without objection. Thank you very much. Um, now, as to the fifty thousand dollar hip hang contribution. Was it you or was it Mr. Riotti who decided to make this contribution? Who, yeah. who, who made that decision? Congressman Cummings, I did. You made that decision? Yes. When you decided to, 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 to do that, did you think that it was legal to do it? Yes. And what did you base that on? Uh, this is a sub of the, it's a U.S. corporation, at least a sub of the, of the U.S. corporation is a sub of the foreign entity has to generate U.S. revenue. So you felt comfortable that you was doing something legal? At that time, yes. In one of your interview memos, um, I saw that you said that you first talked to Mr. Riotti about the $50,000 contribution only after the fact, uh, after you had made, that, made it. Is that correct? That is correct. During that discussion, it was Mr. Riotti who asked you if uh, it was okay or legal for Hipping to make the contribution? That's correct. Right. And as I understand it, you told Mr. Riotti that the contribution was legal because Hip Hing had revenues in the United States. That is what you told him, and I guess based upon what you, a, a question that you answered a little bit earlier in this series of questions, I guess, I mean, is that accurate? That's accurate. All right. Um, at that time, um, that's what you truly believed? That was what I truly believed, yes. You, had you talked to a lawyer about it at all? I did not. Um, so you believe that U U.S. subsidiaries of foreign companies could legally make political contributions if they had revenues in the United States? That is correct. Mr. Wong, it seems that the reason Mr. Riotti asked you whether it was okay for Hip Hing to make the contribution, just like when he discussed whether citizens and green card holders could, could, could contribute, was that he wanted to make sure that the law was followed and complied with. Do you believe that? That I do. And why do you say that? He just wanted to make sure that the things was still right. Mm -hmm. Now, as I understand it, um, going back to this one million dollar uh, contribution, um, Mr. Riotti said that he wanted to raise the funds. I'm sorry, if you wanted to follow up on that question, you're certainly welcome. Now I'm going.
Well, did you want to follow up on the question? No, All right. no. Sir. I'm going to go back to the $1 million uh, contribution. As I understand it, Mr. Riotti said he wanted to raise the he wanted to raise the funds and not give the funds. Is that true? I wasn't sure exactly words, but to me at that time was probably not a, that much difference anyway. Okay, so so you know he had a means to give a million dollar himself. Yes. And did did he have the means to raise it? To raise or give himself. Okay, so you're not sure what he meant. Is that what you're saying? When you first had your discussion with him it, about it, it did that. not really make that much difference to me. But the million dollars is the key. You know. Now, after um, Mr. Riotti told you that he had told Governor Clinton that he would try to raise a million dollars, you then talked to Mr. Riotti about who could contribute to the campaign. Did you have a discussion? With we regard? did. You did. Right. About who could contribute. Right. And. Um, Mr. Riotti discussed that only United States citizens or green card holders could make legal contributions. Is that correct? We identified the people with those kind of, in that category. That fell into that category. That category yes. And so you felt that you all were doing something, what you were doing was legal. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. I will yield to Mr. Waxman. I, I thank you for yielding. I just think some things ought to be straightened out on the record. Uh, we've checked about this clear and delay matter. Uh, the chairman is absolutely incorrect, as I pointed out, because we've requested 302s, which are the reports of the FBI investigators, and they've told us it's an active investigation. It has not been concluded. There has been no letter to Mr. DeLay clearing him. Secondly, I want to put in the record uh, a, a statement of uh, the cases prosecuted by the U.S. Department of Justice and the Federal Elections Commission. Chairman said Democrats have never been fined. Everybody's going soft on these Democrats. Sun Diamond fined a, a million five. Uh, Nicholas Rizzo, a million four ninety nine. The Gephardt President uh, Committee had an $80,000 fine. Jesse Jackson's campaign in 88, uh, a $150,000 fine. Uh, Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee uh, was fined $75,000. Look, statements are made. There's just absolutely no basis for them. Even the statement that was made about whether the time was there on the timer was incorrect. So I just, you know, I know people may be watching this. Uh, it's just like you can say whatever you want well, and the hope no one ever catches up. I don't have the time, but I certainly would urge that. Uh, what, what, I yield. 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 Now, how much were those fines you were talking about? Uh, a million five. A million four hundred ninety-nine thousand dollars. What were the dates on it? It was a 1993 and 1997. Can I see that? Uh, uh, certainly, you're welcome to see it. And I'd like to have unanimous consent to put it all on the record. Without objection. Without objection. Uh, the fines that we see here are nowhere near the six, eight, five million dollar ones. They're much, much smaller. But uh, I will uh, accede to the gentleman's uh, comments that. Uh, there was some fines there that I was unaware of. But the fact is, the vast majority of the fines and the huge amounts that have been levied have been levied against the Republicans. Uh, the gentleman... We should have investigated why those fines were levied, because there might have been problems there that were worthy of a legitimate campaign gentlemen, investigation. Gentlemen, uh, time has expired. Uh, Mr. Uh, Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, this is the first time I've spoken today. And I, I want to state that I'm not going to ask for additional five minutes, but I'm going to take my time as it comes. I'm not going to ask Mr. Waxman to yield to me. I asked him once today, and he said no. And then when I asked you to yield me time, he objected. And I just want to say that I think Mr. Cummings asked more questions in his one visit than Mr. Waxman has in his two days. And for us to have the incredible amount of dialogue about how much time it is taking to ask you questions, Mr. Wong, when we haven't even had the opportunity, basically, to ask questions, because Mr. Waxman wants to talk about anything but you. And I'm just going to read the letter that was supposed to start the spirit of these hearings. And so, Mr. Wong, if you have to be here tomorrow, you have not me to blame. But in the letter that Mr. Waxman sent to this committee, in denying us an opportunity to basically ask you questions privately, so we wouldn't have to ask so many questions publicly, I will read you the full letter that we got. Thank you for your recent letter regarding immunity for John Wan. I am glad we were able to reach an agreement on this matter and am looking forward to his testimony. As you know, in the past, many members of our committee have expressed concerns about the practice of extensive questioning of witnesses in closed session. I share that concern and continue to believe that the committee and the American people will best be served by having Mr. Wong 
appear at a public hearing with no restrictions on the amount of questioning he would face. So I will strongly take exception to Mr. Waxman complaining to any question I ask, and however long, and if he gets tired at two or three today and wants to leave, he may leave, I'm staying. And then he said, I appreciate you sharing your new proposal for dealing with Mr. Wong's testimony with me, but believe we should proceed as originally agreed and hold a public hearing with Mr. Wong. Mr. Wong, I am sorry to say this, but I'm gonna say it since he wants to rehabilitate you before I think you deserve to be. You are a convicted felon, is that not true? That's correct. Right. You have acknowledged this committee that in one way or the other, you have been involved with almost a million dollars of illegal contributions with Mr. Riotti. Is that not true? That is true. Okay. You are here only because you were given immunity. Is that not true? That is true. Okay. You had an opportunity to come before this committee many years earlier and set the record straight. Is that not true? Yes. So the fact that you're here today is basically a decision you made by deciding not to come earlier. Is that not correct? Yes. Okay. Now, you know, I left last night having a lot of compassion for you. I think you're a good man, but I do think good men sometimes do illegal things. And the purpose of these questions are to find out what you did and what you didn't do. Now, I didn't make these accusations. Mr. Burton didn't make these accusations. And in fact, put the mic and in fact, I gave you yesterday a copy from the Cox report. Don't want to blindside you. I want you to deal with it. And I would think you'd want to because it's really scary stuff dealing with you. And I was touched by your comments about your uh, children and the concept that you could, in fact, have done something contrary to your own country's best interests and that potentially you could be involved with espionage. Pretty frightening stuff. And something that, frankly, I don't have a sense that you are, except we have a report. Now, on this committee is Mr. Cox, a Republican, Norm Dix, a Democrat, Porter Goss, a Republican, Doug Biedreier, a Republican, Mr. Hansen, a Republican, John Spratt, a Democrat, Kurt Welton, a Republican, Lucille Roybal Allard, a Democrat, Robert Bobby Scott, a Democrat. They came out with a unanimous report, and this unanimous report mentioned you. And it mentioned uh, some very serious accusations about you. And I frankly, if they were said about me, I would be horrified. Now, it basically says, Juan maintained contact with representatives of the Lippo Group while he was at the Department of Commerce. During the 18 months that he was at the Commerce, Juan called Lippo Bank 232 times, in addition to 29 calls or faxes to Lippo headquarters in Indonesia. Juan also called, contacted Lippo consultant Meili Tom on 61 occasions during the same period. Juan's records show 72 calls to Lippo joint venture partner C. Joseph Girari. During his tenure at the Commerce Department, Wong used a visitor's office across the street at the Washington, D.C. branch of Stevens, Inc., an Arkansas-based brokerage firm with significant business ties to the Lippo Group. Stevens' employees indicated that these visits were short in duration. Wong used these offices two, three times a week, most weeks, making telephone calls and regularly receiving faxes and packages addressed to him. Commerce Department approval, excuse me, No one at the Commerce Department, including Wong's secretary, knew of this additional office. Wong met with the PRC embassy officials in Washington, D.C. at least nine time, at least nine occasions. Six of these meetings were at the PRC embassy, People's Republic of, of China. When informed of these contacts, Jeffrey Gartner, the Department of Commerce Undersecretary for Trade Administration, was taken aback to learn that Wong ever dealt with anyone at the PRC embassy. The proposal of these, con the purpose of these contacts is unknown. My time is up. I don't choose the additional five minutes. I'll come back when my time is allowed.
Who's next? Mr. Mr. Lotret. I'd like to ask you then, Mr. Lotret has the time. Did the gentleman, Mr. Wong, be able to respond to those statements? No, no. Uh, I'm going to go through. He'll have time. I'm going to have my five minutes, and I'm not going to ask you for five minutes and be at your mercy, Mr. Lotret. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I was going to say, uh, sadly, I have to return to Ohio pretty directly. I'm on very strict orders to pick up two Britney Spears Barbies and something called WrestleMania 2000. So, I, I was going to say uh, before this. Uh, recent brouhaha, I was going to commend uh, uh, all of our colleagues for the, the last two and a half days. I've, I've been on this committee since I was elected in 1994, and from my perspective, and, and maybe I'm just a dope, but from my perspective, I thought this was one of the best hearings we've ever had in this committee, and I, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank Mr. Waxman uh, for the courtesy that he's extended to me and, and the members on this side until, again, this recent brouhaha. I also want to make an observation uh, about the staff. and, and uh, this is the, the best prepared uh, I've ever been for a hearing, and the materials that the staff on the Republican side uh, have prepared for this hearing are exceptional. And I, and I hope you give them all raises and, and Christmas off and everything else. And I'm sure that I, I've seen Mr. Waxman's staff run to him with, with notes and, and things, too, and I'm, so, I'm sure that they've done an excellent job, too. But I was, during the break, I was talking to some of the staff, and, and some of your staff didn't get to go home for Thanksgiving because they were preparing for this hearing. And I, I want to commend them publicly uh, for the materials that they put together, because I, uh, I think it's swell. Now, Mr. Wong, it's a long time since anybody talked to you, and this will be the last opportunity I've, I've, I have to chat with you. And I, Thank you. I, I want to tell you, <clears throat> last night I couldn't sleep, and so I watched the replay of, of the hearing yesterday, and that's one of the sad things about being in Congress. You, you like to watch C-SPAN more than most people. But uh, a couple things occurred to me, and, and it helped to refresh my memory of of what happened at yesterday's hearing. And, and I think, uh, I'm not going to make a wild accusation, but, but I, I come away from this hearing with a, a pretty clear indication that in the years 1992 and 1993, you were, in essence, a, a bag man for the Riotti family to, to make illegal contributions to uh, primarily Democratic campaigns. I know Mr. Waxman brought up the fact that you contributed to a couple Republican senators, but, but basically that, that's what you did. and, and uh, you, you are asking us to believe that, uh, you know, even though you weren't caught yet, even though you weren't prosecuted yet, in the 1996 cycle, the same kind of conduct was going on. Uh, and, and, you know, I'll take you at your word that you were no longer knowingly engaged in, in uh, conduit contributions. But I, I think the evidence before the committee is that in 1996, maybe Charlie Tree took your place as the bag man for the Riotti family to get illegal contributions to Democratic candidates, uh, uh, both nationally and, and locally. And, and the one comment I would I would say to the distinguished ranking member, I, I think it's disgusting that either Republican or Democrat state parties would receive um, illegal campaign contributions. And I, I don't know how it is in California. In, in Ohio, we have uh, county commissioners. I, I think you have county supervisors, maybe. Um, but we, we had a race uh, in, in my home county. It was decided by 80 votes. And, and to think that Pauline Canchanilac uh, selected the county commissioner of, of, of the town where I live it is disgusting to me, and I, I would think it would bother Mr. Waxman if uh, an illegal Republican co contribution uh, picked his county supervisor. I think that's disgusting, and, and I think we, we have to do something to, to change it. I, I want to um, go through um, some, some matters uh, after this scandal broke and talk to you about some entries in, in your diary and then and as I said, I'll, I'll be done, and I thank you and your lawyers for the courtesies you've extended to me. If, if you could go to Exhibit 525, um, it is a page from your diary from early uh, October 1996, uh, and it is after the news stories about your fundraising had begun. On the left side of the page, your notes say, to my, the way I'm able to cipher them, uh, quote, principal, not to talk, president, first lady, vice president, call these people. Do you see that on the exhibit, sir? <laughs> do, do you find that on the exhibit? Yeah, I do find it. Okay. I do find it, Congressman. And, and that, this is your diary, and those are, that's your handwriting, and you wrote that sometime in 1996, right? It was my writing, yes. Okay. Can you tell us what, what does that mean? I can't think of it.
Congressman, uh, I, I don't at this moment. No. Okay. I, I want to make, does it mean, however, I understood you said you don't know what it means, but when I saw it, 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 it to me it sounded like somebody told you not to talk uh, or not to answer questions in response to inquiries on this particular matter, the, the fundraising scandal. Does, does it mean that? Or you just don't know? It well could be that way. The reason is because the media has been calling, calling me. I recall, so I'm I was not supposed to talk to media directly. And, and that might be the case. Would, would that have been at the request, at the advice of your lawyers, or the advice of someone else? Oh, the, the advice of just basic DNC's policy. There is the, the person handle all the communications. I was not the person to do that. I, I, I'm wondering if I. I uh, could ask unanimous consent for five more minutes if anyone has a problem with that. Is that okay uh, with you, Mr. Chairman? I, I'm next. Uh, what I'll be happy to do is to yield to you my time. I, I thank you. I have no objection. Well, I'll give you the we're, we're going to stay with the five minute rule from now on, so I'll yield you my time. I uh, have five I, minutes right now. I, I thank you. Um, and and I, I have two, two other uh, exhibits I want to talk to you about. 532 uh, is a page from your diary. Um, dated October the 21st of 1996, and it indicates that you received a call from an individual by the name of Ernie Green. Um, do you have any recollection today why Ernie Green uh, contacted you by telephone on October the 21st? Is this on the left-hand side, sir? Uh, let me right-hand side on that. Hang on a second. Found it, Congressman. We found it, Congressman. Find it? Yeah. Okay. Basically, that was the message, I think. Uh, maybe I'm asking you. Did, did he? Did Ernie Green call you on October the 21st? And do you know uh, why? And and specifically, just so we get a note on. indicating, just a, I took the voice me, voice message. I just took the by time basis. Who called me? Say 6:22, 7:22. Who called? What's the words? You know, basically the message, not necessarily a conversation I had with him. Okay. And the, the last document I want to ask you about is Exhibit 537, and it's a travel reimbursement that you submitted to the Democratic National Committee. Um, and, and it has some, some words on it that, that uh, intrigued me again. And, and uh, it says that you traveled between the, uh, the 11th of October and the 15th of October, 1996, uh, under purpose, the, the purpose of the travel, it says stayed away from D.C. Uh, now, that's an interesting purpose. Uh, were you directed by the Democratic National Committee to stay away from the District of Columbia in October of 1996? Congressman, uh, perhaps that was the, the situation to stay away from D.C. because a lot of media is coming over, and uh, I don't specifically recall right now. You know, I returned home back to L.A. to do what and to get material. I don't know what kind of materials I was getting. Right. Uh, well, I did that, that's the second notation. But right. again, this is a form that you would have submitted to the Democratic National Committee to be reimbursed for an e-ticket to go to Los Angeles. And, and the stated purpose that you put, you didn't say that you were traveling to raise, raise money, visit friends, do, do party building activities. You wrote that the purpose of this trip was to stay away from the District of Columbia. Uh, and apparently, folks at the Democratic, did, did you get reimbursed for this? Did they pay you th for the e-ticket that you took out to Los Angeles? The, an the answer probably is no, okay. because I still have a lot of expenses being unpaid by, uh, by DNC. Okay. But, but the fact of the matter is that, that you felt it was appropriate to request reimbursement when the stated purpose of a trip to Los Angeles was to stay out of, out of Dodge, basically stay out of the District of Columbia after a series of stories had broken 
questioning your involvement of uh, fundraising for the 1996 presidential race. Is that a that is fair good statement? Yes. Observation. La last thing, and, and then I'll, I truly promise I'll be done. You uh, took a trip to Taiwan, um, and uh, in uh, 1996, did you not? Yeah, during the I believe the May of 1996. Right, and and in particular. If you want to look it up, there's an exhibit 436 that indicates that you were traveling between the 17th and the 23rd of May, uh, 1996. Uh, did you ask permission from the Democratic National Committee before you traveled to, to, to Taiwan? I did. did. Did you indicate what the purpose of traveling to Taiwan on, on Democratic National Committee business was? Uh, potential looking for potential the, the donors. You, you went to a foreign country to look for donors to the Democratic National Committee. Let me explain to that because I'd, I'd, I'd like to know. There are a lot of uh, people have a various residencies, although they have a legal status, for instance, citizenships or green card ho uh, holder. They're traveling back and forth. Their business over there, their business over here, more or less is to, to see. What's the, what is the possibility on that? Now, this is a basically spurred out on the on the uh, a, a information that at that time the Republican side, of Mr. Barber, uh, Barber, uh, indicating he made a trips over to Asia, and some people mentioned to him to me he might have been receiving some contributions through the trips that raised a few hundred thousand dollars. So I was trying to make an attempt to, to, to scouting around at that time. Oh, wait, wait a minute. Are you saying that someone mentioned to you that Haley Barber might have gone over to Taiwan and was raising money, so you thought you could go over to Taiwan and see if you could do the same thing for the Democrats? It's not Taiwan. I'm talking about he was making trips to Asia. It's, you know, there are a lot of uh, either Dem Democrats living abroad or Republicans living abroad, things of that nature. I, I understand that. I, I think the only comment I would make, because we were talking about Pauline Kanchanilak before, I mean, you, you thought in 1992 that she could contribute and was a citizen, uh, but she wasn't. I mean, she, she wasn't. Her contributions were illegal. I, I, I'm just wondering about the propriety of, of going over to a foreign country. I mean, would you ask these people? I mean, okay, I'm, you know, Mr. Mr. Jones, I'm meeting you in Taiwan. Do you do you have a green card? Are you, uh, you know, temporarily absent from the how, I would do that, yes. I, Those things I would do. You know what? I, I, I want to believe you, but I, I doubt it. I no, mean, I, I also I, knew some of the people were these U.S. citizens. I, Congressman, I, later on, there was, a, there was a fundraising event related to, to that fact, sir. Gentlemen, gentlemen's time has expired. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Chairman. Mr. Waxman. I'd be pleased to yield time to Mr. LaTourette if he has any other issues he wants to pursue. I'm, I'm done, and I, I appreciate your courtesy. It's your time, Mr. Wax. Well, then I just want to say to Mr. LaTourette, I want to express to him my appreciation to him for his professionalism and the way he's handled these hearings. And since he indicated to us he has to leave, I want to wish him a Merry Christmas. Uh, I want to uh, just go back to these inflammatory allegations of espionage relating to Mr. Wong. Yesterday, I played a videotape of Representative Solomon who on national television stated that there were in electronic intercepts showing that Mr. Wong passed classified information to the LIPO. I then introduced the FBI 302s, which are the FBI interviews. And these were interviews with Mr. Solomon, where he admitted that this sensational allegation was in fact based on a piece of unsubstantiated gossip that he had heard from a stranger at a cocktail party. Now, some of my colleagues then suggested that even though Representative Solomon's accusation was baseless, there may still be grounds for suspecting that Mr. Wong was indeed a spy. The chairman indicated his belief that closed door hearings might, might turn up grounds for suspecting Mr. Wong engaged in espionage. And I gather, according to Mr. Shays, if we asked these questions of Mr. Wong in secret so the public couldn't see what was going on in this inquisition, that we could get statements from Mr. Wong that he wouldn't give in public. I find that hard to believe. I think the public ought to see what an American citizen such as Mr. Wong has been is being subjected to for three days. The record demonstrates, however, that these allegations that Mr. Wong committed espionage have been investigated. They've been investigated and they've been determined to be groundless. 
in its plea bargain agreement with Mr. Wong, the Justice Department stated, quote, that it is not currently aware of evidence which would support any charges of violations of the national security or espionage statutes. David Vicenzano, head of campaign financing task force, reaffirmed in a May 1999 letter to Mr. Wong's attorney, quote, the lack of evidence that Mr. Wong has engaged in other illegal conduct, end quote. Treason is an incredibly serious charge. And I'd like to politely suggest to my colleagues that unless and until we find evidence of espionage, that it is a little stronger than cocktail party gossip that we ought to be throwing out there in the public domain. We ought to be treading carefully. Mr. Wong has suffered through, uh, suffered through uh, uh, enough, it seems to me, from unsubstantiated and sens sensational accusations. Mr. Wong, uh, Mr. Shays made a whole big speech. He talked about this Cox report, which I think you were questioned extensively about yesterday. You weren't even given a chance to make any comments. Do you want to say anything more? These people are throwing these charges that maybe there's still some, some possibility that you've been engaged in espionage? And while you're talking to your attorneys, let me point out that what I just read was the conclusion of the Justice Department of the government of the United States. They have all the facts. They've had all the evidence. They've been able to talk to all the, the relevant uh, people. And uh, they've reached this conclusion that there's just no evidence to make this kind of accusation against Mr. Wong. Seems to me at some point uh, the press ought to report that fact and, uh, and the members ought to finally accept it until they know something more uh, to, uh, to uh, raise it again. Mr. Wong, do you want to say anything? First of all, let me say uh, I, I'd like to thank Congressman Shea yesterday. He passed along this copy to me. This was the first time I had the opportunity to read that. And certainly I, I don't, don't understand the, uh, the, the, whether Mr. Shea actually making an allegation against me yet, but certainly I'm here trying to help out to clear it up. In the past, apparently, through my attorney and also reading and certain things, uh, the law enforcement that made the investigation, basically they found out, not, um, uh, didn't find anything on me on that basis. But I, I like to, I didn't even ask my, my attorney's consent. I, I really like to take the opportunity to save few things in a general term basis. I am an immigrant, you know, like any other immigrants coming to this country, they either suffer from political pressures from the overseas or their home country, or they are seeking for a better economic opportunities here. Uh, back to 1969, I came over here for graduate schools. At lowest point in time, I only have about $20 in my pocket. And I really appreciate the opportunity that this country is for me, like many other immigrants in my category, to be able to, to make something and have a family. Given the nature I understand about human being, we we'll, we'll always want to be grateful, trying to reciprocate certain things to, for whatever we, we, we've got. Uh, so we, deep down in our heart, we all want to have opportunity to reciprocate either to society, to the degree of our ability. So if we have a larger opportunities, larger ability, we want to do more, the less we do less. Now it varies from people to people. So the last things we want to hurt, the country who offered the, the opportunity to us, who will grant us the opportunity for us to prosper. Uh, I believe that's the, same, that's the same intention I have. As for I grow, being prosper, I try to give a little bit more back. That was my full intention. So I just want to make this statement. I, I really did not have any intention to, to be this lawyer to somebody who's been nice to me. I always want to reciprocate. I might have made mistakes on, uh, along the way, but uh, that was never my intention. Mr. Shays. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Mr. Wong, um, uh, Jerry Solomon isn't a member of this committee, and he's no longer a member of Congress. And um, I am very uncomfortable with any of the allegations he made and 
especially given uh, how they were made. And uh, as one member of Congress, just as one member of Congress, I really feel for you, and as a member of this institution, I would apologize to you for what Mr. Solomon said if it was based on the accusations that were made. But um, I wouldn't even think of asking questions based on what Mr. Solomon suggested. I, I want to ask questions, but evidently, you know, my colleague on the other side of the aisle wants to give you that impression, and it's not. And I thank you for pointing out that I did give you the report the day before. The Cox report was bipartisan. It wasn't partisan. In fact, they left things out um, of the report if they couldn't make it bipartisan. So everything in here was agreed to by my party and uh, Mr. Waxman's party. And these are uh, honorable people on both sides. Now, I will say to you that I went up to look at uh, anything else that it, it might include you. And I want to say to you, there's not much more there than is here. So in that part of it, I don't want to even give you the impression that I know something there that doesn't exist here, to be fair to you. But, but even here, it's, it's pretty significant. And I think there can be answers to everyone. And so I don't make the assumption, because I ask these questions, you're going to somehow uh, be proven to have been a spy, or in fact, uh, even been proven to have um, uh, foolishly given information you should have. There may be some gray areas that you and I will have some disagreement on. Um, but uh, first, I, I want to understand that you did work for the Riyadis before you worked um, as uh, um, for, uh, the, the chamber, uh, for the Commerce Department, uh, and you worked for them after uh, you worked for the DNC. Excuse me, you, you received some payments after you work from the DNC. The gift you have, money, you yes. You have maintained a contact with the Riyadis that, that starts in 85 and, and continues to this day. You are friends. They, they are friends to you. This is true, is that not? Uh, basically, it's true, but the contacts in the last few years are very, very sparse. Right. But, however, there was contacts, as Mr. Chairman asked me yesterday. Thank you. Now, is there anything that you want to respond to based on what I read to start. Is it possible, uh, Congressman Shea, yesterday Chairman Burton gave a copy of the various uh, faxes, a uh, phone call that I made in uh, Stevens' office. Whether, whether that can be put on the, uh, the screen or something like that. Is it possible? Do we have copies of the, the faxes and, and the list of things? Oh, there we have it, right there. Oh. Not going to really help you much. OK. Well, if right. he has copies. So what number is it? Is it? You have a number on that? <coughs> To, to, to take a copy down to him, please. Thank you. I was wondering I can, first of all, explain this facts first, if I may. Looking at the facts down here, is, uh, it's very interesting on 1018, 10, there are probably 18 of the facts showing on the sheets here. And I, I sort of believe that was a bad transmission. It was related to only one. 
It was couldn't get through, I couldn't get through, couldn't get through, and again and again, again, again. There was a similar situation, it looks to me, this is like the October 5, there was about five of them also sent it out on a similar pattern. So that would not be treated, my personal opinion should not be treated as uh, how many transmission you send, there will be counted at how many faxes were sent on that basis. That was trying to explain. Now, in my best rec recollection, those faxes sent it over to, say, in Hong Kong, to Indonesia, was not really my, was not my. Now, I would not deny the fact I used the office making phone calls to Lippo Bank, California, in Los Angeles. That one, I definitely would say yes on that. But certainly, I don't recall whether I made I might have sent any faxes to Lippo Bank or not, all right? But certainly, in, in more specific about those uh, to Hong Kong, Indonesia things, most likely it's not related to me. Thank you. I'll, I'll come back to you. In Mr. Cameron. Thank you very much. Um, let me uh, ask you, going back for a moment to the uh, $50,000 hip hing contribution. Now, wh when you decided to, m to make the hip hang uh, 50,000 contribution, you thought that was legal? Yes. And what did you base, base that on? As I, re uh, I uh, reported to you, Congressman, earlier, mm. number one is a U.S. entity, it's, all those is a sub of the foreign entity, but the U.S. entity has a U.S. revenue that uh, that led it to me to, to make decision, you know, Hipping could make contribution that. Now, did you ever have a conversation with Mr. Riotti where you discuss ways to violate campaign laws? Congressman, the base is not in those terms which you raised, but we, we did talk about how to raise money, you know, identify the people who are eligible, you know, with the green card holder of citizenships among the executives, um, and also talking about it being re reimbursed later on by myself, okay, my, my, myself's a contribution, and also I had occasion to obtain some bank accounts I think at least one of the bank accounts from the one of executives. Well, but you um, did, 
to, to your knowledge, well, I want to just go back to, to one thing just very quickly. When you were discussing the, the $1 million commitment, the $1 million commitment now for contributions, did you ever discuss with Mr. Riotti that the reimbursement for political contributions might be illegal? That reimbursement issue was never, never explicitly discussed. Okay. But, but as I report to you earlier for your earlier questions, I sort of sense that you know whoever made it probably will be taken care of. Mm -hmm. And is that what you told the FBI? I believe I did that. I was very. Um, and moved by the comments that you made a little bit earlier about um, how you felt about this country and um, not wanting to do anything to hurt it. And I noticed that in the uh, report, in the Cox report, it talks about how you did not want your clearance status increased. Um, was there a specific reason for that? In other words, your secret clearance, things classified, so you could see certain types of classified information. You didn't seem to be too anxious to have it increased. Was there any reason for that? Congressman, as of this day, I don't even know what level is clearance is about. What is the tiers and so that? Be very truthful, I didn't know. In order to do my job, whether I have a clearance or not, you know, it's not really that important to me. And I was working for Mr. Chuck Meisner, who was the Assistant Secretary of my job. I, I think basically that was through his effort trying to get me the clearance. Mm -hmm. It really did not matter to me at all. Looking back on your experiences at, at the experience at Commerce and what, what you've been through so far, I mean, how do you feel today? Uh, when I was in Commerce? Yes. <laughs> I really underestimate the uh, the culture of this town is very political and very territorial. And uh, so it's constantly in battle trying to gain more either territory or gain more uh, visibility, maybe responsibility towards that part. And I really have a mixed giving about the, a lot of political appointees. Because they're staying on a job that's only a short-term basis. Maybe they're, they're thinking of getting a very hardship coming to work in Washington, D.C. They're trying to gain as much as they can during the shortest period of time. And hopefully they go on, they went on for the next level of a career basis. So, so apparently that responsibility or the title, or which translates into the territory later on, might have been very, very important to some of these people. So without any doubt, during my, my, my tenure in the Commerce Department, and I got caught in between those kind of conflict. Uh, for instance, my assistant secretary would not refuse to attend somebody's briefing, somebody's meeting. But I was assistant to my assistant secretary, but my unit has to be represented. So most of the time, I got their jobs. So whatever the briefing, some of the articles are talking about, I attend so many briefing or meeting re re related to China or other places. That was through that kind of format, because uh, somebody had to be there to represent. Otherwise, nobody went over from my units. Then our unit would be criticized. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, I'll now take my time. Uh, the hip Hip Hing uh, Holdings contributed $50,000 in August of 1992. Uh, the contribution was reimbursed by LIPO. Uh, was that uh, reimbursement legal? It was not. It was not legal. Uh, did you, were you aware of that? At that time, I was not. You was not aware of that? No, I was not. Remember, the, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, there was an uh, exhibit showing me there was a request, reimbursed request, with my name on it, John Huang and uh, 
and in another person's name. Mm -hmm. My name was there. I take responsibility on that. Although the request for reimbursement. But it was corporate money coming from the Lippo Group in Indonesia to reimburse the Hip Hong. For various company. expenses that, right. that I contribution. Have, I, I have the, uh, uh, the uh, wire that she sent to Mrs. Ong. That's Bing, correct. Uh, for, uh, for the money. All right. Uh, I just want to make sure that was clear, that yes. it was illegal, it did come from uh, Indonesia, and it was reimbursed to the Hip Hong, who, which didn't have a great deal of money at that time, as I understand it. Uh, Hip Hong was, was not. It was relatively slow, low. Yeah. Mr. Shays, I'll yield to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wong. We left with um, you having a number of phone calls to the Lippo Bank. Um, we have down 232 while we were at Commerce. Uh, I'm unclear as to why you would be in contact with the Lippo Bank. Okay. First of all, Congressman Shays, I'm not sure I really had a contact with the Lippo Bank 232 times. We'll stipulate that, but it was a, a large number of times. But you're not agreeing necessarily it was all 232, and I don't uh, care. I'm trying to, try to explain to you the, how the number is coming okay. out. As the ordinary situation, if I'm going to call Congressman Shay, I'll guarantee you I will not get you the first time. All right, probably the call is going to come back to me, may not get to me which is likely happen in ordinary courses. So that's why I'm saying the, the real conversation may not be that much. Fair enough. Okay. Now, I do not remember the specifically each conversation was about, but I'll give you the roughly the categories, what are those conversations probably going to fall into, and I'm going to report to you on that basis. As you know very well, I left Lippo on July 15. Uh, July 14 or 15, the weekend on Friday. I immediately come on board on the 18th, Monday. Really, I, and also, as, uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Chairman was mentioned yesterday, at the end of June, after 26, I, I traveled to overseas, uh, following my civic duty to join a, a trip with a committee of 100, went to Taiwan. And also, more importantly, on a personal basis, I even missed my nephew's wedding one day. So that was the purpose I went there. By the time I came back, I did, really did not have a time to wrap around a lot of things to inform a lot of people that I was leaving. So category one, number one is a lot of people still send messages to my old office. There was some mail still coming over there. So that's a category on that. Second thing is, including that category is if people say, well, there's something coming in, I don't understand how to handle, John, how to handle those things. So that's one category. The second category will be, I had been in that institution for a few years. So a lot of people were employed under me prior to that. They're still working over there, even though I was gone. A few of the people, they met with the career problems because they were dealing with the new management, different management. They were asking me what to do. You know, they have frustration. So that would involve some career uh, consultation on that basis. That's, that's one category. It's interesting, the, uh, the third category is the clients also complain because they were dealing with the different people who say, well, we were doing things differently previously, now everything has changed, what should I do? They thought I might be able to help on that basis. So that's one. Uh, the, the fourth category is, what's the situation as you know, in running a financial institution, you, today you, you have a loan situation. Doesn't guarantee the loan is going to stay on for, forever be good because economy con condition changes. Then loan becomes relatively slow being paid, become delinquent, or sometimes you cannot even collect it. You want to look for somebody. So basically the bank was in the Chinese American community. A lot of them are Chinese. They may, might have coming from Hong Kong or Taiwan. So the new CEO or new loan officer is going to ask me, do you know this person, you know, when we were there before, do you know how we're going to handle this and what would be the proper way to handle that? If they are slow for 90 days, should we do something, legal action against them or should, how do we handle that? So 
similar situation like that. Okay. The fifth category is the more personal one. There is a colleague of mine called Mr. Ken Yuan, Y-U-E-N, who used to work with me in Hong Kong in the international department. While I came over to Lippo, Los Angeles, I was sort of pull him in with me to establish all the rules procedures of the international department for the bank. Now, he and his wife has a one only daughter, apparently has a little bit Down syndrome status. Now, by having him and his family coming over to work in the United States, we sort of made a commitment to let him have an immigration status uh, in the United States done. Now, because the, the Down syndrome situation for the daughter, she already passed the age of 21. In fact, right now it's about close to 30 or 30 some already at that time. Now, Mr. Yuan and Mrs. Yuan were able to get the green card status, but the daughter would not because the law saying you have a, uh, not underage children, it's, uh, it's uh, already over the time. And at that period of time, the immigration law was in the midst of the changing, at least there's some sentiment to change because we get so many immigrants coming to the United States. They were very, very concerned, especially Mrs. Yuan. She almost has a little nervous, weak, uh, nervous breakdown type of situation. Suddenly will be hype up and very nervous. So worried about the daughter. In the event she could not get it, although the parents got it already, will be sent back to Hong Kong. Now, I was in Hong Kong. I also working with various senators before by making the contribution. I know some of the people. I took on the jobs, and I made quite a lot of phone calls. For instance, you, you might find my phone records with Ms. Nancy Chen, who used to be assistant to Senator Paul Simon, who has the responsibility of the immigration. Well, my next round is I'll, I'll ask you about the other calls. Thank you. OK. So essentially, I can think of can summarize on that. Now, I would not rule out the situation. Occasionally, I may call some people and say, how are you doing? You know, things like that. OK, these are the things. Never, never the case is saying, why, well, today I got a briefing. You know, here's the information I want to pass to you. Would you relay this to somebody? It never happened that way, sir. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Chairman, I, I'm going to yield my time to Mr. Shays, but I would, before he starts uh, with his questions, could we give the, uh, Mr. Wong and his, his uh, lawyers a break? Give me a break. I think it's uh, close to lunchtime. Let's just break here for about 30 minutes, and that will give you time to grab a sandwich or something, if you so choose, and we'll be back here just about 5 after 12. Committee stands in recess. Thank you. <coughs> In a moment, the House Government Reform Committee continues its questioning of former Democratic Party fundraiser John Wong. Then, at about 3.15 a.m. Eastern, the National Association of Manufacturers reviews its key policy issues of 1999 and outlines its priorities for 2000. Later, at about 4.15 in the morning, the Close-Up Foundation hosts a discussion on U.S. trade and the World Trade Organization. C-SPAN. Created in 1979 by America's cable television companies. Tomorrow, on the 200th anniversary of George Washington's funeral, our companion network C-SPAN will take you to Mount Vernon, Virginia for a reenactment of his funeral procession and service. Live coverage begins from the Mount Vernon mansion at 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 Pacific, and includes a funeral service recreated by Washington and Lee Custis family descendants and descendants of Washington slaves. We'll also open up our phone lines to hear from you about our nation's first president. 
George Washington's funeral reenacted, part of our American President series, live tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 Pacific, on C-SPAN. Next, the House Government Reform Committee continues its third day of questioning Democratic Party fundraiser John Huang. Indiana Congressman Dan Burton chairs the panel. Our coverage of the rest of this hearing lasts about five more hours. Mr. Waxman passes. Uh, Mr. Shays. Hold on one second, please. Um, should we wait for your count? You have two counts. Are we all set? You can proceed, Congressman. Thank, thank, thank. Okay. Um, Ms. Mr. Wong, I'm going to have a number of questions. I'm just going to kind of go through uh, questions relating to your experience at Commerce. Um, I don't know if they'll uh, require long responses. I will come back later to some of the security issues, so you'll get a chance to kind of respond to everything that was in the in the report. But let me um, let me do that. Oh, except, excuse me, we did need to. We did need to uh, just conclude the the issue of we you had responded to Lippo, but um, would you respond to the 29 and the 29 fact calls or faxes? Your your point to me is that some of those may have been resubmitted. So you're 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 trying to tell us you're not trying to tell us you are telling us that some of the 29 calls or faxes to the Lippo headquarters in Jakarta were. Um, potentially repeats? It could be. If you look at the date on that. Uh, you had 61 contacts with the Lippo consultant, Maile Tom. Yes. Or 72 calls to Lippo joint venture partner, um, Joseph uh, Girard. Can you explain your uh, contacts with uh, Maile Tom and to uh, Joseph Girard? Yes. Maile Tom basically she is a community leader in our, in, based in California, in our Asian American community. I respect her a lot. A lot of the political sides of wisdom or uh, community affairs, I resort to her. She and I probably have quite a lot of phone calls on, basically, on those subjects alone. Um, certainly, again, I, I will re reiterate about the number of phone calls. Uh, Congressman Shea, you understand, that may not be exactly equal to the number of actual conversation on that. I, I do understand that. And the record notes it. Right. Let me um, ask you questions as it relates to your seeking employment and commerce, and we're going to kind of go through that. Okay. Uh, did James Riotti urge you to work for the government? He did not. Virtually, that was my initiation and with the urge of my community, that certainly Mr. Riotti would not object that I will, will go. Could, I, could, I, could we be a little uh, tighter on this? And could you uh, think a second before you respond? Because it, it's our sense that the task force uh, that the, at Justice had the impression that he was encouraging you to apply to, uh, to some government departments. So maybe, I, I don't want to split hairs with you, so I'm, I'm not saying just commerce, but didn't he encourage you to work? In various areas. Yes. Various areas will be interesting. Again, I plead innocent about it, the government-related jobs. It was never working in the American government before. Uh, you more or less just pull out a plum book to see what, what would be the area you might be able to fit. We've all done that for right. constituents. So, so bottom uh, line, you had dialogue with Mr. Riotti about that. Why do I have a... No, no, you did have dialogue, conversation yes. with Mr. Riotti. Yes. Um, did uh, Mr. James Riotti encourage you to look into any jobs at certain agencies? Yes. What particular agencies did he encourage you to look into? If I remember, there is a little notes which I even drafted up, sent it to, uh, that including the State Department related to, say, Asia Affairs. Asian, uh, Asian, yeah. uh, Asian affair. Did uh, uh, James Riotti suggest uh, to you that you work at National Security Council? 
That will be a, a one of the list, so I was going to report to you anyway. At what time do you, uh, um, at that time, did you know what the National Security Council was? Oh, it's not really that clear, but certainly I do now, yeah. Why didn't you ask uh, Riyadi what, what the National, did you ask him what it was, or did I, I do not know exactly what he meant. Maybe he was, he had the idea of how that was the, the policy-related stuff, you know, yeah. advising the president. Did you think, uh, did Riyadi explain why he thought you were qualified to work at the National Security Council? He didn't, he didn't say that, but deep down in my heart, probably I would not get that, that kind of job anyway myself. Okay. Did Riyadi also suggest that you should apply to the De Department of State, and your answer was yes? That's right. That was one of the lists, I believe. And did he explain why you should look at the Department of State? Well, basically related to Asia. You know, my background also was Asia. Did you keep James Riyadi updated on the progress of your appointment process? It took why, uh, to directly answer the yes, but was not really in it with frequency because of, uh, I think the memo indicated. So it wasn't a routine update, but periodically you would update him? There was some conversation on that, yes. Um, you stated in your task force interview, according to our information, that James Girardi was a bit naive about any benefit that he might obtain by working, by you working at the Department of Commerce. What benefit did Riyadi believe that he would get by your working at the Department of Commerce? Uh, probably, I, Congress might, I think the, the focus may not be even narrow to the commerce because our original intention was not only go to commerce or the state of the NSC. Well, um, then we won't limit it to right. commerce, but, but the, uh, so your, your sense is that he thought it would be beneficial um, to, um, to him that you work in government. Explain to me what that would be. No, the, I believe what I was saying, the naive portion is in getting those kind of jobs. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can you yield me? Uh, I will yield, yield you my time. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I'll be a little clearer. Um, he obviously thought it would be a benefit, and what do you think he thought the benefit would be? My thinking is because his uh, lipo space is in Asia, because I can get the, you know, the, the those kind of jobs related to Asian Asian Pacific affairs. Certainly, some of the things, you know, be easier. You know, he might be able to get some information on that. Fair enough. Um, is um, why did you say that he was naive? Number one, the information from me it's going to be naive. I cannot really freely, if I swore in to take the job, I could not give the information. So your your sense is that he had a sense that you would be able to be more helpful or be helpful to him in a way that you uh, felt you couldn't be. That's correct. Yeah. Now let me sure. inject one more point. Probably be important is I will have to sense that he will have to tell people in that part of the world that there is somebody used to working in Lippo now is right. in the government. That will make him look, you know, different. Okay, fair enough. Um, I'd like to um, have ex uh, exhibit 153 uh, put up. Um, the attorneys, it's 153, exhibit thank 153. You, thank you, sir. Now, this is a letter from Maile Tom to John Emerson, who worked at the White House Office of Presidential Personnel, that recommends you for an appointment on. Uh, on on, now, it's going to be not the first page. I'm going to ask you to turn to... I'm going to ask you to turn to one, two, three, or four, five. It's six, page six. You'll see it at the top right corner, page six. That's where she talks about you. Now, I will note that while it's still up there, the and this may sound like a cheap shot, but we all in government have to be concerned about it. This is a letter from the state of Connecticut stationery. 
No, state, state of California. California. State of California. It's the Senate. It's David Roberti, who's president pro tem, and, and Maylie Thomas is administrative director. And she is bl talking blatant politics in, about, in her letter, recommending various people and, you know, why they would be good for the Democrat Party and why it would be good to have Asians work. Not a letter that Republicans wouldn't write, and I hope to gosh they would write, um, but, but on, on the President Pro Tem stationery. The first uh, two sentences, John Wan, Executive Vice President of Lippo Bank, is the political power that advises the Riotti family on issues and where to make contributions. They invested heavily in the Clinton campaign. That, again, is in the statement that uh, you wouldn't see in some Republican letters, too. But investment heavily in, in the Clinton campaign is why I want to clean up campaign finance reform. And then it says, John is the Riotti family's top priority for placement because he is like one of their own. I mean, this, this is, um, uh, do you think this is an accurate description of you? I would reluctantly say yes. I would not really, you know, you're boast not, myself. You're you not know. boasting, but but you are um, uh, clear. You, that's your position, and you are a political power, and uh, uh, you do advise them on issues and uh, on where to make contributions. And uh, and that last line, John is the Riotti family's top priority for placement because he is like one of their own. In other words, you are very close to the Riotti family. That is correct. Yeah. Um, do you know that Ms. Tom was planning or encouraging your appointment? In general sense, probably yes, because he, she was in the, you know, the more senior persons in our community. Right. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Tom is uh, in contact with James Riley about your interest in obtaining an appointment. Was she in contact with James Riotti about your interest in this appointment? I, I really don't know exactly whether she did or she did not. Well, but you stated in previous... Uh, I, I believe she probably did, yes. She's pretty close to the Riottis herself, correct? She, no, she's not. She, she doesn't work for the Riottis? No. She doesn't control... She worked for, worked, worked for Riotti as a consultant, as a, as a Lippo bank, but it's not very close, though. Okay, I, and I, I think it's a good distinction you're making. I want to make sure I sure. don't put words in your mouth. She is a. She has a working relationship with the Riottis. Um, she was employed by them through the Lippo Bank, so they know her and she knows them. Uh, not Lippo Bank, the Lippo Group in in Lip, the U.S. Lipo, okay, Lippo U.S. Group, uh -huh. uh, in the U.S. Right, correct. And so they would know each other, but they aren't necessarily say as close as you would be with the family. Th that is correct, sir. Okay, but they have this working relationship. Congressman, me, I uh, apparently she mis misstated my position. I was not the executive vice president for Lippo Bank. Okay. Yeah. You, what were you, just for the record? If I remember, if based on that day of power, I was the vice chairman and director of the Lippo Bank. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, You'd be pleased to know I'm going through many pages of questions, and I'm not asking you. So if you see me do this, uh, don't uh, be grateful. <laughs> um, you got a job working for the um, Department of, of Commerce, and you were principi principal deputy assistant secretary for international economic policy at the International Trade Administration. That's correct? That was uh, correct. Excuse yes. me, Mr. Shays. Yeah. Mr. Waxman is not here, so we'll go to the next round, and it's your time. Thank you. Um, would you please describe your responsibilities at the as, as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Economic Policy at the International Trade Administration? To, to put it very bluntly and directly, whatever the Assistant Secretary does not want to do in our door, so most of the work is like a organizational, personnel-related, budgetary, and coordination among various units in the IP, uh, I, uh, international economic policy. How, how large is um, uh, IEP at ITA? <laughs> it's a, it was the smallest unit. Uh, 
I may misquote a number for you. I, Give I me a range. I, I have no range. Uh, uh, how many personnel would you might might you be dealing with? Maybe in a number like a hundred, one hundred something. Okay, yeah. but it's still a lot of people. Uh, that's correct. Okay. When you worked, um, when you worked in this position, were you ever told that you were specifically walled off from working on China issues? Was not, but I learned that later on. And but in reality, Congressman Shea, I knew I was not going to work on the China issue. Okay. Um, you learned later on that you weren't to work on Chinese issues on, uh, by whom? I mean, what did you learn later on? Was it through contacts or through the media? Or how did, through what? the media, for the, I believe either the, Mr. Garton's testimony, there was, was a member. Is the Under Secretary of Commerce? He he was Under Secretary. Under Secretary usually their responsibility is all the administration of the department and so on. So, but he he seemed surprised that you were working on Chinese issues. That's what I heard. Yes. In terms of policy areas, where did you get? You, did you get involved in Indonesia? Did you get involved in Taiwan? And did you get involved in China? Tell me uh, in each of those areas on policy. Okay, basically IEP is involving territorial, which is in the whole world, divided in probably four or five right. areas. So whatever the commercial policies generally is coming from the IEP. That's how it is. So certainly there's areas called Asian Pacific uh, area, which has its own deputy assistant secretary. Right, but I mean, you, you worked for the Lippo Group, and I think you know that there were some who were concerned that you had these ties to a fairly powerful family right. in Indonesia. Were you walled off of dealing with Indonesia? I did not have a direct responsibility for those areas anyway. I tried to stay away with it okay. myself. So you made a conscious effort to stay away? You made a conscious effort. I did not think anybody would stop me from doing that. No, my concept for that is if I have any knowledge, I could be helpful to everybody because of my past experience, I would be glad to help. That was my, my position. But nobody, ever advised you. but nobody advised me in saying, well, John, don't touch Indonesia, don't touch China, something. So there was no uh, understanding when you work with the department that given your involvement with Lipo Group, you needed to stay away from the Indonesian issues? At least at, at that time, I did not understand. But I'm trying to consciously stay away, yes, as much as I could. Okay, well, at that time, I, we need to nail this down a little better. So I'm happy to have you. Let me be clear on the question. Right. Um, I just need to know whether um, in your hiring you were told that certain areas were off bounds given your relationships with a powerful economic and political family in Indonesia who also had significant relations in, to China. Not necessarily a geographic area, but I did discuss that, that I'm trying to stay away from the Lippo. Okay, that was, and who was that discussion with? I think it was the general counsel of the Commerce Department, at, um, Ginger Lu. Okay. She was personal advised me that. Yeah. Okay, so it, it was her responsibility to, to give uh, ethics advice, and, and she, she said, not as much Indonesia, but in terms of um, in terms of the Lippo Group, you needed to stay away from that. Yeah, that that also can expand because Lippo has interest in other area. Whatever the Lippo is involved, and in, trying to stay away. Okay. Um, your your. Uh, own calendar indicates that you had had several meetings with Indonesian officials. Not, not. I'm not saying Lipa Group. 
uh, your testimony is that Indonesia was not part of your responsibility. Was any country part of your responsibility? Is your uh, testimony going to be that no country is part of your responsibility? That's not true. At the beginning was that, and later on I was assigned to, to Taiwan. The reason is because of my background. I grew up in Taiwan and spent about 20 years there. Um, and also served in the uh, Chinese Air Forces in Taiwan as a reserve officers. Uh, the reason I, I got that is because China was responsible, was taken over by other unit, but somebody should, should be uh, spearheading on the Taiwan, so you have a two separate teams on that. Thank you, thank you very yeah. much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would you like me to do a little questioning here for a while? That'd be fine. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Let me follow up uh, Mr. Wong uh, on Mr. La Tourette's questions. Uh, you went to Taiwan uh, who did you meet with during that Taiwan trip? Basically, the private businessman, in particular the person called... Excuse me, it will come to me in a second, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kenneth Shu. What was the purpose of that meeting? Um, giving my role for the uh, for the Democratic Party, I'm trying to see whether it would be interesting. He had an American. I understand he is American citizen, but although he lived in Taiwan, and he and I knew each other, and I'm trying to see whether he would be interesting in the um, in in making contribution to uh, to the Democratic Party. Did you ask him to solicit other contributions? No, the reason is that he himself was very well off. He would be the only one I need at that time. How much were you expecting him to give? Uh, approximately the possibility of half a million dollars. Half a million dollars. Right. Can you broaden your, your answer there to, to tell us, I mean, you were in Taiwan for some time. I've been over there myself many times, and there's a whole bunch of people that you meet with. Were there any other people that you met with that uh, were interested in contributing, and uh, did you mention it to anybody else, and who all did you meet with? I know you probably won't recall all of them, but you know the significant ones. Uh, Mr. Chairman, during that period of time, you know President Lee was, uh, was first being elected as the president of Taiwan, and there was an inauguration event over there. So a lot of people coming from overseas there. There were a few people coming from Taiwan was there also. Uh, for instance, uh, well, you were you were, you were interested in raising money for the Democrat Party, and so you talked to this one gentleman, and we're hoping that he'd give a half a million dollars. And you're saying he was a U.S. citizen, so he would have been legally entitled that is to, correct. to contribute. But is he the only person that you talked to about raising money over there? No, it's not. Well, no, I was more or less explore, exploring the opportunity through some of the friends who might be able to introduce me to more people. Okay, now with those people that you talked to over there, were they American citizens? They were American citizens, yes. And uh, did you talk to anybody uh, uh, that were not American citizens about contributing? No. Not, not American, I did not ask for contribution. Did not really ask for, say, you want to make a donation or a contribution to did the Did you party. talk to them in any way about giving money? No, sir. In late 1996, did you stay in Charlie Tree's Watergate apartment for a period of time? Yes, I, as I testified yesterday, I believe... Uh, but you did stay in his apartment? That's correct. Mm -hmm. How long did you stay there? Um, maybe around a week or two at the most. Do you know why you were staying there? Uh, I think the... Uh, During that period of time, I was, I was, uh, there's a subpoena being serving me uh, by Judiciary Watch in trying to find out the FOIA situation. 
for the Commerce Department, and I was really staying around different places. I really... You didn't want to be served with a subpoena? No, I, I was really wondering why I was <laughs> being served for the subpoena at the beginning and why I got so involved. You, you were staying there in order to not be served? It, it was not trying to avoid to be served. Actually, my counsel, legal counsel, has already received it, this, was doing that thing for me. But basically, the media was haunting me. If I continue staying with my father-in-law's place in Silver Spring, people continue going to harass that place. So basically, I was uh, also avoiding that part. It's not on the legal requirements, sir. So you, you weren't trying to hide out so you wouldn't get served? Oh, no, no, it's not, sir, no. Uh -huh. Did you stay with any other friends or acquaintance, acquaintances during that period, during the finance scandal when it first became public? Yes, I also stayed with my brother-in-law for a few days. Mm -hmm. you and know, that was for the same reason, because you didn't want to? That was the same reason, and also another friends of um, my father's friends in, I think, Potomac or Rockville, Maryland at that so time. So you were moving around to different locations? For a few, few days here, a few days later there. I regret I did that, but really had no choice under that time. I did not want to have my, my family or relative being harassed by the media. But I did not really try to surround, you know, go around, you know, to avoid a subpoena, no. But it was because of the media and not because you didn't want to be served. That is correct, sir, Mr. Chairman. In late October and early November, there's a large volume of telephone contact between you and Charlie Tree. At this point, Tree had not been identified as a part of the f uh, campaign f fundraising scandal. For example, on October 28th, Tree called you five times. On the 29th, Tree called you twice. On the 30th, Tree called you once. On the 31st, he called you five times. On November 9th, he called you. On the 24th of December, he called you three times. Do you recall what you were talking to Mr. Tree about? Was that a call to my home in Los Angeles? Uh, I just want to be, be specific on that, sir. I, I'm not sure whether they were to your home, but they were to you, wherever you were. Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to yield you my time if Mr. Thank Waxman you. is passing. They were different phone numbers, I've been told by my staff. You know, Mr. Chairman, I'm not sure I had that many conversations with him, even though I might have with some conversation with him. Do you recall any of those conversations? Would not be any any significant, probably basically because of sympathizing my, my matters. Now that sounds strange to me, Mr. Wong, because he called you five, seven, eight, 13, 14, 17, 17 times in that time frame, 17 times. There must have been some reason for him to call you and you don't recall at all? I really don't know. I, I can't give you any answer for that. Well, what were you, what were you and Charlie Treat, what would you talk about? What were you talking about? Did you, I mean, did you talk about friends, relatives, campaign fundraising, what, when you did talk to him? No, uh, I really need to look at those lists. Maybe I can give you a little bit better answer for that. Well, not even talking okay. about those calls. Right. When you did talk to Mr. Tree, you were not a close personal friend. You, no, you, were, you were an well. associate as far as raising campaign funds, were you not? That's correct, but also he subscribed with my idea of trying to, you know, work on something for Asian American community as well. Now we have a similar goals in helping out, you know, Asian Pacific Americans. Were you in telephone contact with anyone from the LIPO group during that period of time when these 17 phone calls took place? Mr. Chairman, it is possible. I don't, I don't recall at this time. You don't recall that either? You don't recall any of these 17 phone calls, and you don't recall whether or not you talked no, to the No, I don't at this, at this moment, no. 
the list of those? Let me go on to the next question. We'll come back to that. Did you ever discuss with Charlie Tree whether you're going to mention his name to the media or to investigators? Did you ever talk to him about, you know, I'm going to, or did he ever ask you about, are you going to talk to the media about me or are you going to talk to the investigators about me? About you. I don't think so, though. No. To mention about Mr. Tree's name is I'm going to report him. Did you, did, did you ever talk about, did Charlie say, hey, uh, John, don't, don't, don't mention me, or are you going to mention me to the media or when the oh, that answer is no. You never talked to him about at that? At that time, no. Well, no. at any time? No, not that I recall, no. Not that you recall. That's okay. right. Did you discuss any contributions that Charlie Tree had made? Or any time, right, uh, Mr. Chairman? You're talking We're about. talking about, uh, I presume, after the campaign uh, finance scandal started. I do remember there's one occasion you talked to me in, in more or less in general sense trying to clarify the, uh, the, the campaign contributions uh, basic rule situation. Uh, more specifically, you say, if I remember correctly, you say, uh, if the money coming from him goes to a third party and then being given, was that as okay or not? You know, I, I said- That's the only time you can recall? That is time, yes. Now let me go back to the phone calls. Right. On October the 10th, you talked to Mr. Tree for 13 minutes. On October the 10th, you talked to him again for 10 minutes. On uh, on uh, October the 28th, you talked to him for 11 minutes twice. On October the 29th, you talked to him for 19 minutes. On October the 30th, you talked to him for seven minutes. On October the 31st, you talked to him for 11 minutes, 15 minutes, both times. On October the 31st, you talked to him for seven minutes and five minutes. And on November the 22nd, you talked to him for nine minutes, and you don't remember any of those calls. I mean, these weren't just little bitty calls. They were pretty lengthy. This is what he does all the time. This is not what you said. You said you don't recall what you talked about. Mr. Chairman, I did say I don't recall what I was talking to him. I did not say I did not talk to him on that, okay? First of all, some of the conversation probably I can, I can respond to you. You know, I was receiving the Judiciary Watch subpoena during the uh, media frenzy period of time of trying to hunt, hunt me. Maybe there was some conversation talking to him whether I could stay there, when I'm gonna come over there. Can he pick me up from certain places and come to his places? He Actually, he did take me from certain area to certain area. He was very helpful to me at that, that part. Uh, within that time frame, I'm pretty sure certain conversations are related to, to that directions. Well, they're pretty lengthy phone conversations, not to be more 
recalled, uh, let me ask you this. Uh, did you ever talk to Charlie Tree about whether or not he should leave the country? That I did not. You did not talk did to him not about talk that to in him. any of these phone calls? No, sir. You, you uh, uh, since there's no one here, I'll yield myself five more minutes. Since, since uh, the, the meeting began and we started asking you questions, we were told that you weren't very close to Charlie Tree. I mean, if he was chauffeuring you around and you were on the phone with him this much, it sounds like you were pretty close and you said he was very helpful to you and you really appreciated that. Now, what do you mean by you weren't very close to him and you weren't his friend? The, relatively speaking, compared to some of the friends, you know, you, I'm not saying I'm not saying he was not his friends. He he was my friend, and he and I, I believe he would consider me as his friend. We knew each other since the uh, uh, 94, June of 94, but knew a little bit better because the the 96 of my uh, my career with the with the DNC. You much better that way. Mm -hmm. A little closer. All you said was he wasn't a close friend. Well, when, when, when you were, he was, you know, you'd call him and talk to him for 15 minutes and then 15 more minutes. You can't recall what you talked to him about then, but when he picked you up and he drove you around to these different places like your brother-in-law's or his apartment or your father-in-law's or whatever it was, what did you guys talk about? Did, and, and, and if you can give me a rough idea, I mean, you know, how much how much time did you spend together? You don't, you Mr. Don't Chairman, if I I can best recollect on this, probably the conversation all center the event the, the the event happened on me at that time. Okay, let me let me go on to uh, the uh, Shilai Temple. Did you see Don Fowler at the temple on the morning of the event? Yes, he was there. He was the head of the DNC at the time. Of DNC fundraiser. Head of the DNC at the in time. In Shilai Temple at that time. Yeah, yes. yeah. Did he express any concerns to you about the location of the event? He did not. He didn't say any that he was concerned about it? Not that I remember on that. Please give me a general description of the, of the event. What, what did it look like? How did it take place? When did, Pre when did Vice President Gore arrive? What did he do? You know, what did he say and that sort of thing? I tried my best. Hopefully I don't omit some of the key part to you. Okay. Um, the compound of the temple is quite large, as you might, might have done already. There's a lot of uh, followers in that temple. There's a welcoming teams right outside the front gate of the temple. And there's a high school band was there also in welcoming uh, Vice President's entourage at that time. Once he was escorted in, uh, there was the touring, uh, not going to a small room first, like a holding room, until all the followers inside the courtyard I was more or less doing the, a, a hosting, a welcoming session. And then he was more or less touring the, uh, uh, the whole compound. Uh, the compound is quite big. So it looks like at least a few basketball courtyards on that. Do you recall the remarks, what kind of remarks he gave, what he said? During that, that touring welcoming session, he did not really making any, any comments. And, and more or less people were welcoming him. He was going through the temple and pay respect to the, you know, to the, the temple. Did, uh, did the meal take place right after the tour and then before he spoke? The, the lunch? Yeah. The lunch afterwards, yes. It went with the, the lunch in place, which is on, on the underground of the main temple. Okay. Uh, after the meal in the temple dining hall, uh, there were a number of people who said a few words, right? You talking about at the meal? At, at the meal, yeah, a number yes. of people. Yeah. Did Congressman Matsui speak at the event? He did. 
uh, did he uh, make any uh, uh, mention of how much uh, money was going to be raised or would be raised at the event? I certainly don't recall he mentioned that, sir. You don't recall that? I don't recall that. Did he make any statement to the effect that they had uh, checked with the lawyers and it was okay to have the event at the temple? I certainly don't remember that he said something like that. Are you aware that several of the attendees at the event said that one of the speakers made comments to the effect? A number of people who were there said that one of the speakers said, you know, it was okay to have it there and that a lot of money had been raised. You don't recall anybody saying that? No, I don't. Certainly I don't recall anybody saying that. So would some, if someone said that, would they be incorrect? Or do you just don't recall? I, I didn't say that. Well, I just don't recall that, sir. Did the Shilai Temple pay for all the costs of the event? My best recollection is they were paying for all the costs for the event, but they were supposed to submit a, a cost breakdown, but somehow they, that thing did not come through so in they, time. So they, in effect, did pay for all of it? That is correct. Did you arrange for the temple to be paid for their expenses? Were you trying to arrange for them to be repaid for the expenses? I, I cannot remember exactly what I did, but as I just said, there's communication with them saying come up with the cost of the event. Mm -hmm. But that cost somehow was never come through to us. I see my time's expired, Mr. Waxman. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I'll pass on this round of questions. The gentleman passes. Okay, let me read this here. Okay. At the conclusion of the event on April the 29th, how much money had they raised? On the, that particular day, I did not really know. Well, according to our records, it was around $45,000. Was, was a small, was small amount, yeah. Well, after the event, did you uh, talk to Richard Sullivan about how much the event had raised? Mm. I did not remember I talked to him for the exactly amount that has been raised. You didn't talk to him about how much money no, they I, raised? However, he did expect me to, you know, to conclude that and bring some money back. What did Mr. Sullivan say? He's trying to wrap it up and, uh, you know, need, need me to go back, bring some money back. There is no specific amount at that time. But he said he wanted more money than that. No, I did not even mention to him about 45000 yet at that moment. I don't did, believe that Did was you talk to anybody about the, how much had been raised? I, not to the, anybody in the DNC, no. Anybody at all? I mean, did you talk to anybody besides people at the DNC? I, I certainly don't recall. However, Mr. Chairman, there is a target goal to, for the fundraising for the Vice President Gore's visit in Southern California in L.A. And what was the target goal? Somewhere like two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollars $250,000, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did uh, Sullivan tell you he was disappointed with the amount that you had raised at that event? Certainly he did not tell me in person. If I remember, he made, I said, that's all I raised. He said, that's okay, you know. He did not tell you that he was disappointed? Not that I recall he ever said that said in, well, in Mr. that language. You know, Mr. Sullivan gave us a deposition. And he says he did tell you that he was disappointed. You just don't recall that? I just don't recall that, sir. Well, that's strange because, I mean, you were in charge of the event, and he was one of the key people at the finance department there. Well, if he said he was disappointed, you wouldn't want to lose face. Wouldn't you say something to him? You just don't remember. I still don't remember that, yeah. Did Sullivan tell you that he had expected more money from the event considering the trouble that you had had in arranging it at the temple? No, as I indicated, Mr. Chairman, there's target goals set it up earlier. It's about two hundred and two hundred fifty thousand dollars I know, but right? did, did, did he tell you that he, uh, that he uh, uh, wanted to make the DNC's end-of-the-month fundraising numbers look good and he wanted more money out of the event? And did he tell you that uh, uh, he expected more money from the event?
I certainly don't recall. I, I, I would assume even myself, I myself was not quite happy with the amount being raised. You know. Well, Mr. Sullivan said once again that he did tell you that in his deposition. He told us that. And he also said that in April he wanted to hit the ball out of the ballpark, so to speak, by raising a lot of money. Did Sullivan ask you if you had any contributions that had not yet come in that were outstanding? And, and did he ask you to raise more? Did he say, is there more money coming in? Or I believe I've already raised, uh, testified I will, I will raise more money anyway. Did you do that at the temple? Did you tell him that at the temple? Not from the temple, no. So you didn't say anything to him at the temple about you'd raise more money because it didn't reach what you wanted? No, I recall. Mr. Solomon was not there, by the way. Where, where, when did Solomon talk to you? Did you have a telephone conversation with him? I had a telephone conversation. That's afterwards, though. Was that from the temple? I don't believe so. It probably could have been from my home. As I understand it, according to Mr. Sullivan's testimony, right after the event there was a telephone call and you two talked. You don't recall that? I do recall I talked to him, but I cannot place the time right at this moment, Mr. Chairman. And you don't recall talking to him about the amount of money or the disappointment or any of that? Not in exactly words you're saying, but, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Did Sullivan ask you to get some California money in? And if so, what did that mean to you? In other words, did he say, get some money in from California? And if he did, what did that mean to you? I don't know whether he did it or not, but it, what he means is trying to bring as much money as possible back. Did, uh, did he mean from Lippo connections in California or Asian Americans from California, or do you know what he meant? Or whatever the, the event I, I, you know, transpired at that time, to, you know, whatever that you can collect at that, from the group over there. How did your discussion uh, with Mr. Sullivan end on the telephone? Did you promise him on the telephone you'd raise more money? I did say I'll bring, bring a good sum of money back this time. Well, if you said that, why wouldn't you remember that he was disappointed in the amount of money that was raised? No, I just did not say, I didn't say that way, Mr. Chairman. I did not exact did not remember exactly what he was saying that way. But I do know all in, for all intended purpose, we want to raise as much money as possible. OK, uh, you have to excuse me. Uh, we have to, I have to take about a three minute break here. I have to make an emergency phone call. And uh, w w would you care to take the chair? I'll let Mr. Shays uh, take okay, the chair. OK, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You got to take the gavel down there, all right. It's Mr. Shays around. Mr. Shays, it's uh, your round. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, yeah, yes. I think we, uh, I have a couple oh, you, you have, it's, it, it is Mr. Waxman's time. We'd be happy to give him the uh, I, th I thought he had passed, but Mr. Waxman? At the previous round. And I won't take uh, much time, so I'll let you get back to your questions. Your mic is not I want to clean up a few things. Want to hit the clock? Uh, Mr. Wong, on this um, Shilite Temple just, yes, event, sir. did you look at it in terms of what's called a maintenance event? Have you ever heard that term, maintenance event? A community event uh, to... The community events, yes. Uh, by a community event, or I've even heard this term maintenance event, 
it's an event not to raise money but to develop goodwill and reaching out to the community maybe even the hopes later of raising money from members there but to establish some uh, positive contacts is that, is that an accurate statement of that's accurate yes and then the other thing I wanted to mention that these conversations you, you had with mr. tree and mr. Sullivan those were over three years ago weren't they that's correct you were being asked to remember details of those conversations. Mr. Tree was not a social friend of yours, as, as I believe you testified. Is that right? Mm. No, he, would. he was at that time. Cause he was at that However, he was that time in 1996. Uh, you know, we, I was in D.C. working for DNC. Certainly, I have some more, more contact with him occasionally than many, many years prior. Thank you very much. I Thank just you. wanted to get those clarifications in there. Um, yield to uh, yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. I recognize myself for five minutes. Um, on September 26, 1994, uh, you were working for the Commerce Department, and you were scheduled to meet with Miss Kristoff. Records indicate that you entered the House White House compound at 5:42. Does Kristoff refer to Sandy Kristoff at the NSC? Let me. Uh, maybe what we do is put up Exhibit 174, which is just the White House visits. This would be one of the 43 times I'm assuming that you, while employed with the Department of Commerce, you met with the, uh, with the in, the, in the White House. And it's on page four that I think we want to put up. Could you get that for me? Could you get, could you get, could you get, four, four. No, I'm asking you to do it. Is it, the question is, who is uh, Christoph? If that crystal could be as Sandy Christoph. Okay. Now tell me, um, did you meet with Sandy Christoph on or about September 26, 1994? I'm, I'm quite surprised that name was there. I've been trying to trace my memory. I, I certainly don't recall I met with her personally on that occasion. However, uh, Congressman Chase. Let me just say that we can turn the chart over to the next two day, and the next page five, and um, y y you're marked down at two o'clock and five, but it, 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 it looks like you didn't actually get there. But I'd like to know if you did or not, whether the records are, are not accurate or not. Before you ask this question, I'm trying to make a further explanation on that. There might be an interdepartment meeting with the White House during that period of time. The reason, if my name was mentioned over there, is because the, the person who's in charge of the Asian Pacific Affairs in IEP, right. namely Nancy Lynn Patton, who's the director, also Deputy Assistant Secretary, she might not be able to go there. Okay, no, but really what we have is we have three meetings two of which you're not marked down as having attended, but the one on the 20, uh, um, the one on uh, 926, September 26, you're marked down as attending. So I'm assuming you were there. I was there. I'm trying to explain you probably this related to the interdepartment meeting. I was late also. Okay. At one occasion. Okay. So, uh, yeah, but you were there. I just want to establish that. You know, okay. you're, you're answering a question I haven't asked yet. You'll get a chance. Um, what was the purpose of your meeting now? Again, it was this interdepartment meeting. I could not spe specifically remember what it was about now. Did you discuss U.S. Thai Business Council with Ms. Kristoff? Oh, definitely not, no. Um, now, d did you represent uh, on what basis you were having that you were there? Was it clear as to why you were there? No. Congressman Chase, the only thing, the only time I have a very strong impression is that one time is raining day in the late afternoon. I was there very late. That's related to interdepartmental department, meeting. 
people was already at a meeting. I came in very late. Probably the meeting was over. Uh, I really did not have any recollection, have any more than one occasion. Man was uh, uh, Miss uh, Sandy Kristoff, okay. except except in the State Department. And when was that? Uh, Before or after? I, I couldn't specify. The reason I'm trying to say that is at that time, the Assistant Secretary for the Asian uh, Pacific Affairs for the State Department was the. Who was it? Sorry. He has a regular meeting for interdepartment agencies. Any department has Asian uh, Pacific affairs units will have a routinely meeting with him. Did you tell, uh, did you tell pa uh, pa Pauline Kachanilak, um, um, she, let me ask you, she was organizing the U.S. Thai Business Council meeting. There was some meeting that was going to take place. You want to talk about that at all? It was taking place in the White House, I think. Now, Ms. Kachanilak was, was calling you at the Department of Commerce, but I want to focus the time frame on September 94. Around that time, uh, she was working on establishing the U.S. Thai Business Council. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Did she discuss with you her plan to hold an inaugural meeting of the U.S. Thai Business Council on October 6 of um, 94? I believe it's on about that, that time, that period of time. Okay. Yeah. But she talked to you about it? She did. Was she planning to have the Prime Minister of Thailand attend the inaugural meeting? She did indicate into that. Was she me. also planning to have the President of the United States attend the meeting? She would like to have, yes. Did she express to you any problems she was having in organizing the meeting? She couldn't get that things done. Pardon me? She could not get that done, at least at a period of time. Get what done? Get this meeting accomplished. Okay. My time has run out. Would you like some more time right now? I'll be glad to yield to you five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want you to be more specific as to what type of problem she has. She has some difficulty in getting things done. In other words, uh, there's apparently a political battle over there. Um, I can only speak on the outsider. I did not really get into the detail for that. I, she, yeah. I understood the Sandy Christoph was the, the opponent would not agree to have such a arrangement. Uh, arrangement in the president? That's right, okay. to have it in the White House. Did she ask your help? She did. And, and uh, what did she ask you to do? She expressed the, you know, the dismay that this could not be done. You know, uh, she asked me whether anything I could do on that basis. But I did not really promise her to say, I'll do one, two, three, four. I did not. But I believe I subsequently I, I, I have a memo to Deputy Undersecretary Rothkoff. So you, you did do something and you expressed it in a memo? That's right. Why don't we look at that? That's Exhibit 192. Now, um, Mr. Rothkoff is the, was the Deputy Undersecretary when you were there. Uh, he was your superior. That, that's correct, isn't that it? That is correct. Had you spoken with, with Mr. Rothkoff about the U.S. Thai Business Council prior to writing this m memorandum? I, did, I don't believe I spoke to him directly. I just have the memo to send it to him. Now, did Mr. Rothkoff express any concerns about this proposed U.S. Thai Business Council event? I don't believe he and I have a direct conversation on face-to-face -face on these issues. I thought I would just send a memo that was in. Okay, and now in the first paragraph of your memorandum to Mr. Rothkoff, you suggest that you and Mr. Rothkoff contact Sandy Kristoff of NSC to find out what is going on before we do anything else. What should you mean by find out what is going on? As, uh, as I indicated to you, Congress Murley, apparently there is some battle going on as to this, uh, this, this proposed meeting, whether it could take place or not. Now, when say we, doesn't mean Mr. Rothkoff and myself.
because Mr. Rothkopf is in a higher level than I do. I did not have any direct contact with Ms. Kristoff in my level, and Mr. Rothkopf has. We meaning probably from the Department of Commerce point of view, or ITA's point of view. You know, in this memo, you expressed uh, numerous concerns and troubles with hosting the, the launch of the U.S. Thai Business Council. First, you stated, matter in this sort presents risks and opportunities. What were the risks and what were the opportunities? Okay. I'd again, I, again, I want to thank you, uh, 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 Congressman Shays, to point out this, this thing, the memo. I have not read this for, okay. seen this for. You know, I'm happy to have you read it and take your time. The risk in my mind at that particular moment was the, the Prime Minister from Thailand was coming over. And also they find out that things was not done. It may, may endanger some of the business opportunity or future relationship between the United States and Thailand. Now the reward side, if this can be done, then it could be bringing up a more opportunity for, for both countries. I guess that, that, that was uh, basically what I meant. Um, you also stated we at the DOC, including the Secretary, can look good and gain benefits if we could get this matter squared away, but we may not want to risk the relationship with Sandy slash NSC, especially if she, Sandy, strongly objects during the launch for this Council in the White House. How did you know that Sandy Kristoff would object to doing the inaugural meeting? Who spoke to her about it? Did Pauline Kachanilak speak uh, to her? This is based I learned from uh, from Ms. Kanchanala. So you're getting this from Ms. Kanchanalak? That is correct. Okay. Uh, what were the NSC objections? I learned again indirectly here. Her, from Ms. Kanchanalak. The, the, the basic objection is coming from Mr. Driscoll. Ms. Driscoll is executive director for U.S. ASEAN Council. Now here is, as you know very well, the Thailand is one of the member of ASEAN nations. So uh, here is this, uh, another person is coming out to set up a U.S. Thai Business Council. Apparently it's going to draw more members away. Maybe that was the politics behind that. What did you mean that the Commerce Department was a neutral party? We were not involved for these uh, direct contact. Who were, so the who were the parties involved? I believe it's the uh, NSC. Or Sandy Christoph directly. Yeah. You also stated, quote, quite a few members of this proposed council from Arkansas may want to utilize their contacts to get this matter squared away directly from the top, even if they offend Sandy and the NSC. What did you mean by getting this matter squared away directly from the top? Um, the best I learned is that when the U.S. Thai Business Council have some members, uh, members who are coming from Arkansas, what I was trying to say, these people also was friends with uh, Pauline Kanchanala. Maybe Pauline would be able to, to ask these people, go directly to the president to get that things done. Who has time now, Mr. Chairman? Mr. Waxman, uh, he's not here. Uh, would you care to go forward? A few more. Okay, we'll yield the gentleman uh, his, well, it's, it's your time then. Is it? Thank you. Um, squared away at the top does not mean the president of the United States? It, it was, it could be directly with the president. Did you tell, uh, did, you, did someone tell you that U.S. Thai Business Council members were planning on contacting Clinton and, and did you speak with any of the members? I did not speak to any of the members, no. Uh, let me just conclude by saying uh, just this area. You also stated that my personal observation is that President Clinton will be very upset if he finds out what's going on behind the scene. I'm sorry. I need to correct the statement. They say whether I contact any member or not, Pauline definitely Yes. Was the member. Certainly, she, excluding her, I did not speak to anyone else. Now, Pauline was the individual who gave 268000 that was from foreign sources that was basically declared illegal? That was the same person, yes. yes. Were you acting on her behalf because of the $268,000? I didn't believe at that time she was giving that money. I did not even know she gave that kind of money. I thought you mentioned the figure was a much later day when I was in DNC. Thank you. Happy to have that clarified. 
um, just to conclude here, but how did you know the president might be upset? Or why did you think he might be? This my personal judgment on that, because the, the turf battle underneath, and just in case it ruined the relationship down the top, if that happened, I'd assume president might be upset. Certainly, I did not talk to president on this matter. Okay. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I, I yield back my time. Uh, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll use the rest of your time, then I'll use mine. I want to go back to these phone calls that you made. We've talked about them a number of times. On These are calls to uh, LIPO organizations, either in Indonesia or Los Angeles. On uh, the 17th or the 19th of uh, July, you made two calls. The 27th one, the 28th one, the 8th of August 2, August 30th one, October the 4th one, October the 5th two, October the 6th you made five, the 11th one, 12th one, and then on the 18th you made 19 calls or 19 faxes rather, uh, 19 times you faxed to, uh, to uh, Lippo Pacific. These are from, uh, from the... Uh, this is Stevens company across the street. But if you look at all these faxes, there were never over four or five cents except on one day, October the 18th. Do you attach any significance to that? Other than the unfair characterization, this is obviously. And, and that was all the way to Lippo Pacific. First of all, Mr. Chairman, I don't believe that was sent by me. Number one. Number two. But you did go across the street to the Stevens office on a regular basis to make phone calls and things like that. At some point, you, gotta, you do have the right to answer the question at some point. Yeah, I, I, I do not deny that, yes. But you don't believe these faxes are yours? By the way, the second answer is, let me finish, uh, sure. Mr. Chairman. I believe the, there was an attempt to send in a fax, did not go through, just constantly resend and resend and resend. 19 times. Probably that was it. Be, my personal experience in the past, the line to the Indonesia may not be that as easily to get in through. Well, I know. That's why we go from July all the way through uh, May of the next year. So for 10 months, the most times they ever tried to fax something over there was five times. Most of the time it was two or one. In fact, there were only two occasions when they tried five times. But this one day there were 19, and you don't recall anything about that. No, not on this one, no. Okay. Let me go back to the, uh, uh, the temple. Uh, now, at the end of your conversation on the phone with Mr. Sullivan, you said uh, you would raise more money. I try to bring, bring more money, yes. Yeah. What did you do after your conversation with Mr. Sullivan? Did you speak to Maria Shaw? I did. What did you tell her? Basically, I said... I only get this much money, and then, and then also vice presidents were here in the event. I really need to bring back some money back to Washington, D.C. on this trip back. How much money did you tell her you needed to get? I need to get about $100,000. Now, at least this, this trip is to bring back $100,000. So you had raised 45000 so you needed 55000 more. In my mind, was that, was that set? My setting was that. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, according to the testimony from the monks who have been immunized and the nuns at the Buddhist temple, the day after the event, Maria Shah called Man Ho and told her that you needed $55,000 and needed it before you left for Washington that evening. Is that what you told Maria Shah? That's uh, her exact language, but the concept is the same, yes. Mm -hmm. Do you know if uh, Maria Shah told this to Xing Yun? That I don't know. I left it to her. According to the testimony of the immunized uh, monks and nuns from the temple, Man Ho then met with uh, Yi Chu, the bookkeeper for the temple, and told her that they needed to make $55,000 in contributions very quickly. Yi Chu then asked the first 11 monks that she saw to write a $5,000 contribution to the DNC. All 11 of these monks were reimbursed for their contributions by the temple. Did you have any knowledge that Maria Shaw had asked the monks to make $55,000 in contributions by the time that you came to the temple on that evening? I did not, sir. She didn't mention anything to you she about did not. that? No. Did uh, she give you the checks? 
She did. Well, didn't you ask her where those checks came from? I did not. I thanked she her. Said she gave you $55,000 and $5,000 checks, and uh, you didn't ask her thing. You testified about this before, and that's not what you said. Mr. Chairman. I, I yield, it's my turn now, so I'll yield myself five minutes. Okay. Go ahead. Ms. Ms. Chairman, the commerce, the, the, the step by step situation, I went to the temple on the way to the airport. And uh, Marie Shaw was there. She handed me an envelope uh, indicating there's about 100000 there. And I thank her for it. I, I know. Uh, the night before, or right after the temple event, you got $45,000. You were concerned about that. You talked to Mr. Sullivan. And you told him you'd try to get more money. You then talked to Maria Shaw and said, hey, we're 55000 short. We ought to get $100,000 for this event. I'm not putting words in your mouth, but that's the gist of what you said. You leave. The next day, she talks to the head of the monastery and says, we've got to get $55,000 more. She's a member of the temple. Uh, she gets uh, 11 monks or nuns to write checks for $5,000 each, and they're reimbursed by the temple. You come back on your way to the airport to get the $100,000, which is in an envelope, and you don't even ask her where the extra $55,000 came from? I mean, she got that in just a matter of hours. Weren't you even curious? No, I did not, because she was the main person that had maintained contact on the other side. And uh, I just mentioned to her, I would like to have a chance to bring back 100000 of trips with me in Washington, D.C. I did not really ask her. I thank her for it. That's it. So you walked into the temple the day before it was 45,000. She gives you an envelope says here's 100,000 and you just say thanks. That is correct. I even thank later on Man Ho came out. I said thank you very much. Why did you say thank you to Man Ho? For all the events this this time she will put out because she was the handling general affairs. But she was the she was the uh, one that uh, uh, was in charge of the finances for the temple, wasn't she? That I didn't know. I do know she was in charge of the general affairs to arranging everything. Uh -huh. See, Manho met with Yi Chu, who was the bookkeeper, and asked her to get the $55,000 out through the monks. And so you said you thanked Manho for her help, but no. you didn't thank her for the 55000 No, she came out as a courtesy. I said, thank you. I just say that. But you didn't know the money came from the temple? I did not. What time did you arrive at the temple on the evening of April 30th? Do you know what time it was you said you were on the way to the airport? I normally take the red eye back, so it must be around 7, 8 o'clock around that time, sir. Mm -hmm. And the only two you met with were Maria Shaw and Manho? Did you meet with any of the monks? I couldn't quite recall there was uh, additional persons in that room or not. There might be a person who was there reading newspaper. I don't know who that person was. But you was. didn't uh, see other monks or nuns in there? That I did not. So the only two that you recall are Man Ho and uh, Maria Sha. Uh, right. In sequence, Maria came out first and then Man Ho later. Did someone give you the 11 checks that had been written? Well, I've already asked you that. And you said that that was already in the envelope uh, with the other. The whole, all the $100,000 was in one envelope. That's all in combined, it, it, sir. You didn't open the envelope or look in it at all? No, I, I just had to dash to the, to the airport. Uh, Ten of the 11 checks are exhibits 403 to 412. Did you know that these checks uh, were, you did not know, you said, that they were written by monks or nuns? I did not. Mm -hmm. And you never questioned where she got the extra $55,000 in a few short hours? I did not question that either, no. You mean the checks? You, you didn't have any question in your mind about where the money came from. You just took it and left. I mean, that is did, correct. You didn't question where the extra 55000 came from? No, I did not, okay. sir. Uh, now, is this on the same one? This next session, set of questions. Yeah, yeah, this goes through. Well, obviously, uh, this event, uh, you know, has received a lot of public scrutiny. Uh, but now uh, that you're cooperating, it's worth reviewing some of the public statements that you've made about the event. 
Right after uh, news of this event became uh, public, Maria Shaw, then lawyer Peter Kelly, stated that this event was a Wong show and that all that Maria Shaw did was make a few phone calls. Is that right? He said it was your event and all Maria Shaw did was just make a few phone calls, but it was Wong show. I was with the DNC, you know, I certainly work with Maria Shaw in getting things done. I did not have any direct contact with the uh, with, uh, temple. I'm not even a Buddhist uh, follower. No, I, so that, that, tr that statement would not be true then, it was totally your event. I was part of a coordination on the DNC this size, sending the other size basically all through. But she's the so one that did all the fundraising. That, no, no, I didn't, I didn't say that she did the fundraising. I also did some, too, myself. For the event? For the event, for the other... From, from people other than uh, members who were the temple? That is correct. All right. Another vice president, Gore is cited in the press as saying that the event was intended to raise the vice president's profile in the Asian American community and not to raise money. Was that true? I mean, was this specifically supposed to be to, to raise his profile with Asian Americans, or was it to raise money? I, I really need to spend a little time to explain to you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and also members committee about these things. As I alluded to yesterday, there was supposed to be a two separate functions. One is really a fundraising at the Harbor Village Hotel in Montreal Park, original set for that. And basically on the Shilai Temple was really a gear to the community function. So people will come over, a uh, vice president will come over to the uh, a largest uh, Buddhist temple in the West Coast. And in, in, in fact, the head of the temple, you know, whom he met prior, uh, in, in prior years. So the basically that will be supposed to be in the Shilai Temple is a community type of event. But due to the the scheduling issues and also the distance between the Monterey Park and the Hacienda Heights, the schedule just ba basically were not allowed to have a vice president going from one place to the other. So the event of fundraising event was totally basically canceled in the Monterey Park, uh, that restaurant. But however, the motion in trying to raise money is already going. So some people being contacted, so some people might be interested in coming in and know about, knew about vice president coming in over there. So in light of that situation, we will sort of more or less put both things together on that. So the whole things, the community, the, the community event was carried on as original plan as well. And people were welcoming vice president coming in. Those afterwards, then the luncheon will be followed on that. So you just added them together at the temple? And all together in the temple in order to fit into that, that schedule. Now, during that luncheon event, I didn't believe anybody was speaking, say, we're going to raise the money to do that. I didn't even believe I collect any checks or anybody stay in the front, uh, collect the money. Besides, the, in terms of partic participants, Quite a lot of people are just as an honored guest coming over. Now, without any doubt, some of the people have made a commitment prior to, uh, to that switching of the places they were coming in. Uh, they were making certain kind of commitments. So some of the money might have been collected ahead of time, but some of the money probably being collected afterwards. So uh, that, that, that's how, how, how they came about for this event. Mr. Chairman. I, I will uh, come back to this in my next round uh, because uh, I'm going to ask you a couple questions about it. Mr. Uh, Waxman. Um, Mr. Wong, I asked you about this, uh, seems like yesterday, but it might have even been the day before, uh, with, with regard to the Shilai Temple. Uh, Vice President Gore has claimed that he didn't know this was a fundraising event. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, as I understand it, his speech was not a, a request for money, but uh, more of a generic speech about uh, everybody being able to participate in government. You now know and had a chance to look at everything about the Shilai Temple, things you knew about then, things you know about now. 
Do you have any information that would say that Vice President Gore did anything wrong? From my point of view, Asian American was very grateful. A person with that kind of status the first time coming over to our community. In particular, coming to a religious group, which is not a majority. Basically, this country is a Christian, basically. Um, in fact, uh, Mr. Waxman, I was asked by Vice President's staff members to the question is uh, how, what Vice President should, should speak about during the luncheon. And I said, well, maybe your Vice President was a major in religious in, uh, in the Harvard University. He will be very qualified to talk about religious tolerance and uh, things in that, in that direction. I believe the, most of the, the speech he was talking about is inclusiveness and then uh, the participation, power religious tolerance, and things in that nature. The other part of my question to you is not just what he had to say, but now that you know everything that he did, he was there, he said he didn't know it was a fundraiser, he gave a speech to reach out to the Asian American community. Do you think that Vice President Gore did anything wrong? No, I didn't. I absolutely not, no. Thank you. Well, I yield back the balance of my time. Um, Mr. Shays, do you want to go now, or would you? If you, if you wouldn't mind, I'd, I'd like to, while I've still got this fresh in my mind, uh, if, if you uh, received checks in advance, and I believe you did, and this was the only event, how could it not be called a fundraiser? Didn't you get checks in advance? I did receive your checks in advance. So, so you knew that it was a fundraiser because you already had checks in your hand. As I report to you, Mr. Chairman, I had the plan as a fundraiser in the restaurants earlier. That motion was going. So any checks I have received, I didn't re remember how many of them, very probably few. I, I know. I did receive knew, the checks. You knew the so two were going to be consolidated into one event because of the time frame. So you knew there was going to be a fundraiser at the, uh, at the temple. Is that not correct? I mean, you've already said you knew they were going to be combined into one event. Mr. Chairman, as I stated, uh, the original plan fundraising event was canceled. And then I didn't recall anybody at that luncheon that was raising money and collecting money. I do know with such an opportunity later on, I would be able to inspire more people giving more money. Did, did, did any of the people that gave you money get special seating at the event? Did they sit up front? Some of the people were willing to making a more commitment, yes, they would. So this definitely was known as a fundraiser because you were giving them preferential seating. You did not give the checks back, so you knew this is what was going on. Now, the, after the meal in the, in the temple dining hall, I'm going back to that, there were some statements made by some people that there was actual discussion by some of the speakers about raising money. And we've got people who said, testified to that effect, that, you know, that, there were the, that were there that said, yeah, we heard people say, yeah, we want to raise some money for the vice president. You don't recall that? 
Uh, Mr. Chairman, are you saying it's right after that luncheon? That's what it says, yes. Okay. The reason for that is by dash off to the airport and go to San Jose right away. You know, I, I, I know you know you're under oath and everything, and I, but you said that that this was not really a fundraiser. You did say that they were combined. And then you said that these people got special treatment by sitting up in front where the vice president was going to be. I mean, you knew this was going to be a fundraiser at the temple. Mr. Chairman, I know your char characterization uh, about the, the event, but I s repeat, I did plan the fundraising in different places. Some people did get money, but people were invited for that event, but I did not really collect the money in that event. But they did get special f seating and everything. Right. Okay, uh, I see my time has expired. Uh, let me take my five minutes since I'm next on the list. Uh, Mr. Waxman's not here, and then I'll uh, yield to my colleague because I have to rush out and make a phone call, and I'll be right back. Uh, another Vice President Gore is cited in the press as saying that the event was intended to raise the Vice President's profile in the American uh, community. I think I already asked that question, but uh, was that the purpose at the temple originally, just to raise his profile with the Asian American community? That's one of the purposes. What was the other purpose? As I indicated to you earlier, Mr. Chairman, this is the first time a, a very high-ranking government official is vice president coming to our community and also can inspire a lot of the religious follower in the Buddhist uh, the sect you know, to, to recognize the fact that somebody is really paying attention to us. Certainly, that will raise the profile of Mr. Mr., Mr. Uh, uh, Gore.